Right. I would now like to call the November 17th, 2020 Longmont City Council regular session to order. Can we please start with the roll call? I'm here. Yes, Mayor Bagley's here. Council Member Christensen? Here. Council Member Doggo Faring? Here. Council Member Martin? Here. Council Member Peck? Here. Council Member Rodriguez? Here. Council Member Waters? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, great. I'll go ahead and lead us with the pledge tonight. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the, the United States, States of America, America, America to the Republic, to the Republic to the for which it stands, one nation, nation, one nation under, under God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. You never know if you know the pledge until you've had it shouted like that in your ear with, with no cadence. All right, um, just a quick reminder to the public, anyone wishing to provide public comment during tonight's uh, first call, public invited to be heard, you need to watch the live stream of the meeting and we're gonna have a call in only like we've been doing the last several months. Um, and I will of course open that um, when the time comes for public comment. Um, the toll free number, just so you guys have it available is 888-788-0099. And so just uh, watch for instructions when, when that time comes. All right, uh, we already approved the minutes for October 27th. There's no minutes ready for this agenda, Mayor. Right, right, that's what I thought. Okay, cool. So do we have any agenda revision, submission of documents or motions to direct the city manager? And Mayor, there was one um, document revision, not an agenda revision. Okay, what Noted in the substitute ordinance for ordinance 2020-62 for item 12A1, right. the that, Costco item. And that leads me to my next question. What is the difference between an ordinance under our consent agenda and the ordinances listed on general business? Those are still first reading of ordinances, correct? Correct, correct. Okay, in case people were wondering, um, that is why. Okay, then uh, let's go ahead. And uh, Harold, it's been a big day with COVID-19 and the governor and it's been, a, it's been a rough week. So do you wanna go ahead and report to us? Yeah, I mean, we actually have a, a fair amount of information to report today based on this. Um, Susan, will you bring up the chart with the new uh, level that the, the governor just announced today? So I'm gonna start with the final revised metrics. Um, so what you can see, and Susan is going to zoom in on this so you all can see it, but Basically what they did is the old level red uh, became level red, severe risk, long-term sustained metrics or multiple metrics met. And specifically what they're looking at is greater than 350 between, greater than 350 and 100,000 cases in a two week incidence. There's no limit on the percent positive. And then hospitalization is staying the same increasingly stable or declining. If you remember, when you look at the orange level, um, it's no greater than 15% on the percent positive. And then what it used to be was um, up to 350. So that's the big change. If you look at level purple, extreme risk, what I wanted to talk about there is that's really um, the old, that's the stay at home component. And what they're focusing on there is the hospital capacity risk being breached, which may be indicated by approaching the need for medical crisis standards of care, utilizing alternative care sites, critical shortages of PPE or staff, or hospitals approaching 90% of their reported surge capacity. So that's really ex establishing the, the stay at home level under this new matrix. Susan, can you bring up the, um, the re revised dial piece on this now? <clears throat> so while she's doing that, I'm going to highlight some of the, the, the changes. And, and as I go in there, um, so it was just reported that um, the state CDPHE did move us to level red. Boulder County, they, they moved 14 counties. They indicated that they were going to move some other counties to orange. And um, also in the press release stated that there may be some additional movements for other counties and they would uh, let everyone know when that, if and when that occurred. But the big change in level red, um, when you look at high risk populations um, is in, where we were in level orange, um, it was strongly advised to stay at home. 
level red actually puts the high risk populations in the stay at home category. So if you remember when we went into the, uh, when we started the uh, issue with COVID in terms of the pandemic, um, older adults fall into that category, people with um, pre-existing heart conditions, asthma, all of those categories that we talked about, they're actually now in a stay at home order based on where we are today. Um, not eligible for variances, um, no personal gatherings. That's another significant change. In the orange level, it was up to 10 from no more than two households. So now they're saying no personal gatherings. Um, in terms of schools, schools is a little bit interesting. So K through five in person is suggested. Middle school, in person, hybrid or remote suggested. And then high school, they're suggesting a hybrid or remote. Um, so you can see they're definitely making the difference with high school with a um, high school age. And then in terms of higher education, they're uh, remote suggested, limited in person when necessary. And what they really talked about was the the piece with the technical and the trade schools where they do need to come in and perform some work. Um, what we're also hearing in some of our conversations in terms of the schools, it's also really managing staffing levels based on people that are out and the governor definitely touched on that subject today during his press conference. Another significant change is really to the restaurants. And so now they're saying take out curbside delivery or to go orders um, or open air dining uh, with only groups from the same household. So they're saying no indoor dining anymore. In terms of offices, um, in the orange level, we were at 25% remote work where it was strongly encouraged. They're now 10% uh, remote work is strongly encouraged. Um, obviously for the city, um, we definitely fall into some of these categories, but we really look at um, critical operations and what that means. So, you know, what you will see us move through is anywhere from the 10 to 15%, depending on the nature of the operation. Gyms and fitness centers um, are at 10%, um, 10 indoors per room or outdoors in groups of less than 10 with res reservations required. Um, again, this is another category that's gonna really impact our organization in terms of what we do in recreation. And so we're gonna have some more conversations tomorrow based on these orders and what that means to us. And then critical and non-critical retail is essentially staying the same as it was in level orange, 50% with increased curbside pickup and delivery and dedicated um, times for seniors or people in the at-risk population is encouraged. Um, events, any indoor events are now closed. Outdoor events have been reduced to 25% or 75 people based on the size. Um, and you have to be within your own household group six feet apart from each other. And that's generally at a high level, the, the changes that are gonna come from this red level. So obviously you can tell personal gatherings is the most, is a big change. Restaurants is a big change. And then the stay at home order for high risk populations. All right, Susan. Um, I also have Dan Eamon on. He's gonna come in after we go over the numbers. Um, are there any questions on that, this first piece? Sorry, Doc, didn't see you. Dr. Waters? Yeah, real quick. Harold, on that list, um, indoor unseated events uh, they are closed. Is that what I saw? Correct. Um, is our library categorized in a, as an indoor unseated event? So libraries are, they have a, a different guidance for libraries um, and it's in a separate area of the orders and we actually are in curbside only right now. So it's based so on that. So that's new. I mean, we're now reverted back to or gone or re 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 initiating curbside only. Correct. All right, thanks. So now I'm going to go into the, the data that the county's provided me. We tried to get someone here, but obviously, with all of the changes, they, they were moving pretty fast today and working any number of issues. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, but when I do that, Mayor, I can't see people. I have a, my other monitor went out. Um, so if you see something, if you'll let me know. Um, 
that will help me. And so obviously right now, I'm going to, um, do you all see the little uh, COVID symbol? Perfect. Yes, we do. Um, so when we go into the slides, this is really what we're seeing in terms of what, what the governor is reacting to. And so if you look at this, the two week cumulative incident rate, um, Boulder County is currently at 758.9 per 100,000. If council will remember, um, that's um, last week we were at approximately 458.8. So we're definitely seeing uh, in Boulder County the growth, but we're seeing that really throughout the entire state. When you then look at the positive, the two week po testing positivity rate, we're currently at 8.3%. During the last um, presentation, we were at 7.1 last week. What's really interesting in this, and, and, and if council asked this question, I'm gonna just deal with it now, I, and, and I don't know the answer, but I'm asking it. So when you look at some of the thresholds, obviously you can see that we were in red in terms of I'm gonna back up. So if you look at this, you can see Larimer, Well, Boulder, we're all in red in terms of the cumulative incident rate. But when you look at the positivity rate, we're actually at a lower level than Weld and Larimer. Um, and those, counts, those counties, when you see the press release, are not included in that move. And so I'm just gonna hit this up front because I've had this question already um, and I've pushed it into both Boulder County and they forwarded to the state to understand that. And so it may be that those counties are going to be counties that move at a later date. I do know that the state wanted to personally have conversations with counties before they made the move. And they were actually able to catch most of the metro counties um, at one time. So that may be part of it, but if there's a question on that, I just, I'm still trying to dig for the answer. When you look at hospitalization status, um, currently um, we're at 11 days of decreasing or stable admissions, but you can obviously see that um, there were other counties that are at a higher level. One of the things that we did here, and um, I think it was in the governor's statement that there were a, a tremendous number of cases that occurred in Pueblo, and they actually had to um, move some of those patients into other areas was, where there was capacity um, based on what they were seeing. And Dan was gonna talk a little bit about um, what we were seeing in, um, locally in Boulder County. So, in, you know, we've obviously been watching the young adult gathering public health order metrics. Um, so what we can tell you on this is we're in the same spot that we were before. Um, new cases and positivity worsened over the last week. And so we're just continuing to move in that area. So now let's take a look at the numbers in Boulder County. Um, so this graph really says it all. You can see that we hit a high of 326. We hope um, that the trend that we've seen recently uh, continues in terms of where we're moving because that will make a difference in terms of the level red piece. And I'll touch on some points that Jeff mentioned to us, uh, but we hope we continue moving in this direction. Um, but I think that's incumbent upon all of us continuing to um, do what's being asked of us as we move forward. Uh, when you see this, I think so, something that's important in this is, you know, for a while we really started seeing fewer cases associated with college students, but now about 12% of the cases in the past week have been among CU affiliated Boulder County residents. So we're definitely seeing that creep back up into the process and, you know, hopefully with the decision that CU's made in terms of their classes, that may change some of the numbers that we're seeing as we continue to move forward. When we look at this, the other change, and we hadn't seen this for a while, but we're starting to see it again, is actually the number of cases that are associated with long-term care facilities. So um, they made up about 5.5% of the cases um, as of 2 p.m. yesterday. So all the data is as of 2 p.m. yesterday. So if you look on the website, there may be more up-to-date data, but this is the one that I could count on. Um, there have been 64 long-term care facility associated cases among Boulder County residents in the past two weeks. Um, and there are currently nine confirmed active outbreaks in the Boulder County long-term care facilities. 
So we're seeing that again as an if council will remember when we talked about this before one of the things that everyone gets concerned about is when you tend to see cases in long term care facilities. Um, a lot of those cases tend to go to the hospital and they tend to be in the hospital for a significant period of time. One of the things that I will tell council about is based on where we are in level red and based on what you're seeing in the long term care piece. Um, and you know where we stand in terms of um, the housing authority. Uh, we are, based on these orders, also going to have to take some actions um, with the housing authority process and, and the um, high-risk adults being in stay-at-home to um, deal with certain areas within those facilities in terms of where people can congregate. So you may hear that, um, but we also have to do that based on the orders and what we're seeing in other facilities. I did talk to the Housing Authority Board today. We've had a couple of cases where we were made aware very late, uh, or we were made aware of positive COVID tests that were very late, almost to the point to where when we found out they were out of the 14-day period. So based on all of that, we're gonna have to take some actions in those facilities to, to ensure that um, we're meeting the requirements and first and foremost, protecting the health, safety, and well-being of the people that live in those facilities. Um, again, our five-day rolling average and daily case count is at about 220.6 cases per day. Um, and that data is through the end of the day on the 11-15th, which is higher than any other time. And it rose from 146 case average on Tuesday of the previous week. Obviously, if we continue on the trend that you saw on a previous um, slide, um, that number will continue to go down. And, and that's gonna be really important in terms of how we look at a potential move from red to orange in the, in the future. Um, again, this is really looking at all of the cities in the metro area. Can you all see my pointer if I'm moving it? Okay. So what I wanna point out here is the red line is actually bolder and you can see the spike when we had it with the university. And then, so we're, we're right about there. Um, so while new cases have been rising rapidly across all of the metro area, uh, Boulder, which is, you know, I showed you the red line is lower than all but Douglas and Broomfield counties in terms of the new case rate per 100,000. Uh, so again, that's, that's important for us to keep in mind as we're moving forward. And, and so now we're gonna look at it in terms of uh, municipalities. So you can see Longmont um, in terms of what we've seen since uh, the 1st of October in the cases per 100,000, we're now the highest um, in, in Boulder County. Um, Boulder, Lafayette, and Lyons have also had pretty high increases, as you can tell. One of the things that they did say about Lyons that they're trying to figure out is a lot of them have PO boxes, so they're, the data, um, they're still trying to work through that issue. Um, what, I will, what I can tell you, though, is in the past seven days, about 39% of the new cases have been in Boulder and 36% of the new cases have been in Longmont. Again, this graph is just a different depiction and it gives you the same look at the data per communities. Uh, dark blue Boulder, light blue Longmont, Louisville, Lafayette, and Superior, and then all the other uh, municipalities in this. And so Boulder uh, for last week had about 656 cases, Longmont 598. Uh, Louisville, Lafayette, Superior, 230 cases, and then 183 in the rest of the county. Um, again, um, the highest cumulative rates per 100,000, they were in the 18 to 22, 23 to 24, 24 to 34, and 35 to 44. So basically that 18 to, to 44 range has really had the highest case counts recently. And, and then this is what we're seeing among um, youth in Boulder County. And I know this, this slide prompted a lot of conversation last week, but we are continuing to see increases in the number of cases of all school age groups um, when we compare it to the most recent two weeks and, and to the previous two weeks. Um, I'm not gonna get into the, the percentage increase but you can obviously see last the previous two weeks were at 15, now we're at 44, 29 to 75, 41 to 110, and then the biggest growth is in the 15 to 17, which is 32 to 136 cases. 
And I think if you tie that into the level red and how they were making the suggestions regarding high schools, you can start seeing um, when they look at middle school and high school where they're seeing that growth. Um, again, the slide says it all. Um, pretty much every category, but this one is is on an increase and it just recently changed. And I think it's hard to tell, but I think that's the 75 plus category. Um, but everything is continuing to increase. Uh, again, now this is an important slide. 78.2% of the cases in Boulder County have a known um, race ethnicity. And this data is as, is as of 2 p.m. 11-16. Um, they again seen persistent large disparities among the Hispanic Latinx population. In the past seven days, 47.6 of our cases or 506 have been among the Hispanic Latinx and 49.3 or 524 cases have been among white non-Hispanic category. Again, just a grass, graphical representation of, of what I just went over in terms of the data and what we're seeing. Um, when we look in the testing, uh, again, remind you 10-1, we're at 4.7. Today, we're at 8.5, as of 10-1, 11-16, a.m. And, and, and when we talk about that 8.5%, it's 8.5% of a significant number of tests. Um, you can see, you know, how many tests we've been performing in Boulder County um, recently. And, and again, Je and Dave, Dan will talk a little bit about what we're going to continue to do in the future. Um, our current 14-day average test per day is 1,635, um, to be exact. Again, this is just um, a different way to look at where we've been moving in terms of the positivity. This is actually a good sign, you know, and it, who would have thought when we were actually just before here and we were below 2% that we would be seeing this move to 8.5% is a good sign. All of that's gonna come into play when we look at the way they've constructed the new dial. Um, again, another example of what the different age groups have been doing over time. Here's a seven day rolling average of PCR tests with positive results at the different age groups. And you can start seeing where some of the drivers are coming in terms of that. And finally, I know we've had a lot of questions about hospitalizations. Um, th this is cumulative over time in terms of what we've seen. Dan's gonna go into more specific detail in terms of what we have today, but this is what's been going on in Boulder County over um, from the beginning. And you can definitely see um, hospitalizations, and this is what the governor talked about, it's actually now starting to occur amongst um, a broader age group and what we're seeing. In All right, something, can you hear me? Yeah. I think I accidentally hit you. I'm sorry, I was trying to unmute myself because I've got a quick oh. question if you go yeah. back. So mm -hmm. I guess what I, I mean in the few, what I would so are these are total cases, right? Correct. Dan's so, going to talk to you about what's happening now. Okay, because because really the data that I want to see, well, I personally want to see is I want to know how many total beds, how many beds are occupied, how many med surge beds are occupied, and how many uh, ICU beds are occupied, so we can see how much is left. You know, there could be 25,000 people in the hospital, but we have 75,000 beds left. And I know that it's getting, I, I know that we're like just a couple beds shy of being at capacity. So I just, I'm anxious to see yeah. that. So Dan will talk about what we have. Um, the, there is a site that I have. I'm, I'm kind of questioning the numbers a little bit based on some conversation I've had, but I'll jump in on there when Dan goes over it as well. So this really talks about our hospital resources. And to a little bit, um, you know, what it's saying is we have 108 ICU beds available in Boulder County. Or total 108 ICU beds, we have 19 available as of today. We have 512 med surge beds, 145. Um, and this was as of 1116. So Dan's going to have the updated information on this. 
So we have 145 available med surge beds, um, adult critical vents, um, 50 total, 28 available. Um, Non-critical vents, you can still see that all of those are available. Um, and then what you can see in the staffing is, um, and, and this one doesn't, we're gonna have to talk about this, but in terms of where they are in the staffing, um, this has changed a little bit because this has been in the green um, and PPE still is in good shape. And this gives you a sense of what we've seen in terms of hospitalizations recently. And again, this is as of 1116, but I think the number that Dan's gonna to report today is probably gonna be back up around 90 in terms of overall hospitalizations in Boulder County. And again, this is the statewide hospitalization piece. And so the blue is confirmed COVID-19. The brown is um, under investigation or the light, the tan under investigation for COVID-19 in terms of the entire state. And then finally, this is um, uh, deaths among Boulder County residents who've tested positive. And you can see how um, from about June 6th to the end of September, um, anytime you lose a life, it's tragic for a community and a county, uh, but it looked much different. Um, we are starting to look similar to where we were um, in April. And I think that's part of what they're also um, looking at. Our most recent death was on uh, the, based on this data was on the 14th of November. They've had 27 deaths since uh, the 1st of October. Um, nine were reported since the last surveillance update. Um, about 71% of the deaths to date have been among the long-term care facility residents. And we've had a total of 108 deaths. So you can understand why we're also watching long-term long -term care facilities. And again, this is the key COVID da data resources. I will also have the full slide, slide deck that I'll get to Don um, to go over all of that information. Um, I know I covered a lot of data for you all today, um, but based on where we are. Harold, let's just, I think Marsha has a question and then we'll finish up. This is just uh, maybe the, this will be in Dan's, but uh, for a while you were showing Longmont specific data and uh, are we gonna see some of that tonight? Um, that wasn't in the slides that, that I was provided from the county. And, and so it was incorporated in some of those other slides. What I'm gonna try to do is, is to get that, but um, to the point of Longmont specific, um, we're, we're now, since the first, we have the highest per 100,000. I think as I indicated, um, uh, we've had uh, 590 in, in the past seven days, 36% um, of the cases have been in Longmont, 39 in Boulder. Um, but we'll get you the more specific data. Yeah, people were specifically asking about hospital resources. Dan can talk about that. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Dr. Waters. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, Harold, I asked this question last week, and I'm still curious because we're not you're not reporting any data from the wastewater testing, and um, I, I thought you said we were close to being we have being able to have or see those data in to include in these kinds of reports because that would be the earliest indicator, right? Correct. So um, we've had some conversations on that. They've actually had the ability to run um, a couple of modeling scenarios and predictions. We've actually only had a, um, two examples of where we can compare what the prediction was versus what the actual count is. So we're waiting on one or two more. Um, we also are going to have a conversation with um, one of the things I wanna do is have a conversation with Dan, Mike Shard, and then the Boulder County Health staff to really have the epidemiologist check our math um, to make sure everything is making sense. And then once we do that, really talk about utilizing this as, an, as a leading indicator. Um, we're not hearing that others are, are doing this work. This is frankly work that uh, Roberto, John Gage, and Becky Doyle have been doing. 
So we wanna make sure that we truly understand the correlation before we go public with it because um, it, we don't wanna have bad information out there um, on, on bad premises. So we have a little bit more work to do. But what I can tell you is I've seen two examples and they were pretty close. So the, so you're validating the modeling, right? right? That's yeah. what you're in the process of doing against the actuals. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea when you might be able to include that? Because if, of all the things we've seen, um, you know, how the urgency we ought to feel is fueled or not. You know, we, we either know that we're, we, we're making a difference or not based on a, a data, uh, a, a statistic like, or an indicator like what we're le learning from uh, testing wastewater. Um, <laughs> I am hoping that I can get some things scheduled late this week where at least we can generally talk about we're seeing lower loads and based on what, I mean, so we can say we're seeing higher loads and we think it may mean something in the neighborhood of this or lower loads and it means this. And that's probably as far as we can get in about a week or two. Um, I think further out, we may be able to get more specific, but um, what I can tell you, um, well, let me get the data and make sure I'm correct before I say this. So moving forward, it'd just be helpful to include, yeah. we're not there yet, right? Just to acknowledge that we're, yeah. we're collecting those data. We haven't finished validation of things. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that from now on. Any other questions? Yep. Nope, we don't see any. And Dan. Then, so, Go ahead. Dan, you're up. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm gonna add three things here. I'm gonna talk about testing hospitals and then uh, vaccinations really fast. Um, local testing, so as everybody knows, we did open up, well, public health opened up a testing site at the fairgrounds and it's been, uh, it's been pretty busy. I think they, well, I know they've run at least a thousand tests every day through that site. It's open eight to five every day, um, seven days a week. They prefer that you do register, but you don't have to. We also have a site over at the uh, Innovation Center, the School District Innovation Center, right there across from the Rec Center. That one's run by a company called Colorado COVID Check, and it's open from 10 to 5, Monday through Friday. And then we've also started doing some targeted testing. Um, Harold talked a little bit about the disproportionate amount of cases in the Latinx community. So Carmen, as Carmen always does, partnered with public health to develop some kind of targeted testing sites that we've done two of so far. One last Tuesday and one today um, down at, at a countryside village that are targeted specifically towards a bilingual par portion of our community. So we have bilingual staff down there, um, kind of resource kits available for everybody coming through. And both times we've done about 120 tests or so so it's clearly showing a need, but what we've also discovered is public health is pretty stretched and we are likely gonna have to pick up some of this burden ongoing. And we've, we've decided as a city, this is something we want to continue to do. So we're looking at ways that we can add staff resources and all of the necessary things to make sure we're continuing this, this service that is a targeted, a targeted testing solution towards portions of the population that don't necessarily want to go to a eight to five testing center or can't. So we're going to continue to do that and figure out ways that we can supplement the larger community testing sites. But um, the larger sites are ripping every day, 100,000 or 1,000 a day. So I think the testing available in the community is good. We are at a good level for that. Hey, Dan, so hospital. before you go on, before you go on on the hospital piece, one of the things I did want to talk to council about is based on the need that we're seeing um, with the county health department in terms of their staff capacity and what we're going to need to do um, to really jump in and help, especially on this targeted testing um, in different demographic groups. Um, I know when we talked to you all about CARES funding, we had some CARES funding established for um, the pandemic leave pay amount within the organization. Um, I'm probably going to have to shift some of that funding over in to help with the testing component of this. So I just wanted council to know ahead of time that in terms of the, the, the funding component, I'm going to look at that piece within the CARES funding. 
So some specifics well, one, on- One second, one second, Joan, and then Tim. Oh, sure. Thank you. Before you get into the hospitalization, uh, Dan, can you tell me if these sites are the rapid 15 minute tests or are they the uh, three to five day tests? No, they're the longer term tests. And most sites, so we've been tracking that a little bit and we've seen about three days is the average we've been getting. They haven't been going too much longer than that, but they're, they're all the, the longer term three day tests. Can you tell me what the difference is between the three day results versus the 15 minute rapid test? No, I really can't. <laughs> but we can certainly get a, a answer for somebody much smarter than I and get it out to you as to the exact differences between those. Okay, thank you. Real quick, Dan, um, I, as you were doing your presentation, I got a text from a resident who was indicating that there is testing, walk, walk in and drive in testing at Salud in the afternoons. Was that one of the targeted locations or is that kind of standard procedure now? No, they've been doing those on their own and they've been a little bit up and down as to exactly when they've been doing those, but they've been doing community testing for actually quite some time. These are new sites that I've been telling you about, but we'll okay, make sure to right. get every location out and make sure that they're up and out on our website. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Are we ready for hospitals? No. Mm -hmm. no. Council Member Dago Ferry. So one more, just for um, clarification, these sites, they are free, correct? Yes. Okay. That's what I wanted to make sure that people understood that they could. And then do, what is the time limit for the one at Countryside? And is that only for the residents who live there or anyone in Longmont? That's anybody in Longmont. And, target, right, and we, we did the last planned one today, but we're okay. planning on continuing that service. It might not necessarily be at that location again, but the mm -hmm. idea will remain the same to try to target a bilingual population or some other underserved population, but it may not be at that specific location again. And okay. since we don't have a council meeting for some time after this, um, the site that um, I'm exploring with, with Dan and Carmen in, in, the, in our local group is actually Lashley Street Station because based on some other data in terms of where I'm seeing uh, generally things occur, that's pretty central. Um, mm -hmm. We've got to make sure that the traffic and everything else works, but um, just in case we move faster than the next, well, we will move faster than the next council meeting. I wanted you all to know that's the site that we're looking at. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right, Dan, let's keep going now. Okay, you got it. Um, hospitals. So today, unfortunately, we did break our previous record. We had 91 in the hospital today. That was up significantly from the last couple of days. And that's countywide. In Longmont, we had 29, which is a significant number for, for Longmont. Um, we can talk about, about beds, and I can give you those up-to-date numbers for today. Um, they're a little bit misleading, though, because we don't break out COVID ICU beds versus regular hospital ICU beds. So those could be filled up with, you know, strokes, heart attacks, whatever. But as of this morning, countywide, we have 100 eight total, 72 of them, <clears throat> excuse me, 15 of them are still available. And then on the med surge side, those are a mix of all kinds of things. But the med surge availability right now is 112 in the county and 14 in the city. But again, those are, they're a little bit malleable. They can shift those around if they need to. But I think the big message that, that Harold was giving really does hold true is they are full. They're definitely full. Um, they have not moved towards canceling electives yet, although that is evaluated pretty much every day. And if they start doing it, it would be electives with overnight stays, those sorts of things. Um, the hospitals are very concerned about staffing. Um, Harold talked about that a little bit, but it's, it's not only just fatigue, they've been doing it a long time, but their staff is also affected by quarantine sickness. But an important point is, they are not seeing any, any, if any, spread inside the hospital. Their people are getting sick like, you know, our, our staff is too. It's outside um, the employment, the place of employment. It's in the community where most people are getting sick. So their, their people are, you know, getting sick just like everybody else. And they're worried about the upcoming holiday season. They're worried about the upcoming flu season, which so far has been actually really mild, which is a, 
one piece of good news I can give you. Um, Harold did touch on this too, but from July to September, there were nine deaths in the county. We had nine last week. So there's some trends that we would certainly like to uh, get ahead of here. Um, quickly on to vaccinations. Um, this is something we get asked a lot and there isn't a tremendous amount of information on these yet. Um, I'll give you what I know. So the state had to submit a plan to the CDC um, middle of October, about the 16th, that really was about defining tiers. Who's gonna get it first? Who's gonna get it second? That sort of thing. And there are significant logistical issues involved with vaccinating a entire world. So the amount of planning that's going into this is just enormous. You know, we've had some good news recently on, you know, from Moderna and Pfizer on significantly good results in clinical trials. And those still need to go through the FDA process to get emergency youth, emergency use. And then after that, it's a matter of manufacturing and distribution. But there's a significant amount of discussion and planning. And I would not I wouldn't think about anything that's going to be community available before March, April-ish. So we're not planning for any widespread distribution before then. There certainly could be some available, but likely those are going to be targeted towards places like long-term care facilities and then down the list of places like hospitals, first responders, but those have not been determined yet either. So lots to be done there too, um, but we'll certainly let you guys know what we know when we know it. That's about all I have, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Dan. Is that it from the city? All right, Dr. Waters. Just one more question, Dan. We, we've heard so much about contract contact tracing mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and people just kind of giving up because of the, the, the scope of the, of the job. Uh, and we've heard a lot that those people being contacted when, we, when people are following up, refusing to cooperate. What, what experience are we having in Boulder County, both with our capacity and the response of, of residents? Well, what we have heard from the county is the contact tracing that they are trying to do. That The virus is so far ahead of it that they're really not trying all that much and they don't have the staff to catch up either. Um, the state was assisting, but they've pulled the staff that they were lending the county to go to other places that were even more hard hit. So the contact tracing in the county is really virtually non-existent. Um, and I don't know about the people answering the letters. They've basically gone to a letter system. And by the time you might get the letter and, you know, check your mail and answer it, you know, we're down the road a little bit. So they're, that's one of the reasons why they're really highlighting the, you know, personal responsibility aspect of wear your mask, do all the right things, because the contact tracing just isn't there. So I'll jump in and answer some of that part of that question too. So obviously staffing is a big issue in terms of the contact tracing based on where we are in the, the level red and what we have to do in some of our facilities. Um, contact tracing is one of that kind of work is something that's allowed in the CARES funding. And so if we have to repurpose people, I did make the offer to um, Jeff and the county. And we're going to talk about this. If I have folks in the organization, so let's say we have to not do X. If I have folks and I can use the CARES funding to pay for them to do Y, which may be contact tracing or a basic contact tracing, that's what I would like to do. And so I had that conversation with Jeff and there's gonna be more um, in the next few days so that we can understand what that means um, for the organization and how we can help them. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, I noticed a uh, kind of recurrent theme in some of the graphs, and I guess it would essentially be sort of anecdotal at this point, but uh, it appeared that as we've come over a crest on a, a bunch of the graphs, that would seem to correlate with the uh, probably the Halloween uh, time of the year. And so as we're just hitting more and more holidays as we go, be it uh, Thanksgiving next week and Christmas and New Year's, uh, is, is that some of the things that, that public health is looking at? Because we do obviously see some trends here with holidays and, and spikes. 
Yeah, they've they've talked about that too in um, the epidemiologist meetings. Of that's a clear trend, and it's certainly a something they're significantly concerned about coming up over the holidays. And I think that was something that that fed into this decision to move counties into the red is to try to highlight that as as a trend and a concern. But that's certainly something that is talked about is that that pattern you just highlight of, of the after holiday spikes. That and it's also pretty clear via what they can ascertain from the data, it's the social gatherings in terms of they're not seeing it at workplaces, they're not seeing it in hospitals, social gatherings. And, and I believe last week it was even kind of iterated that while there are some cases, the vast bulk of the cases from indoor dining uh, do not contribute as heavily as to the uh, private functions. Is that correct? That's what I've heard, Dan. Yeah, that's what I've heard too. All right, let's keep going. All right, that concludes our COVID-19 update. Thank you guys. Uh, it's getting a little tricky as you figure out how to walk that line. So we appreciate you. All right, let's move on to special reports and presentations. The 2020 Colorado APWA Parks and Trails Award for the Dickens Farm Nature Area. Yay, staff. David? Steve? Yes, Mayor Bagley, uh, City Council, uh, Steve Ransweiler, Senior Project Manager for Public Works and Natural Resources. We are uh, pleased to present to City Council an award that uh, the city was uh, provided this year from the American Public Works Association, uh, Colorado chapter for the, um, the top parks and trails project within a large community um, and for Dickens Farm Nature Area. Uh, Pete Adler, who is uh, a member of the Colorado chapter of the APWA, is here to provide an award. And I think Susan is going to um, provide a video to uh, remind council uh, what Dickens looks like. So we'll take this short video here. Steve, you're, you're muted, buddy. You're still muted. We've, we've lost your audio, Steve. Yeah, Steve Ransweiler, Senior Project you, you Manager. Hear me now? now yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think it was taken over by the video. Sorry, uh, as I think most of the council knows, uh, this was a very heavily used nature area in 2020. And we're very proud of uh, this award. And I'm going to turn this over to Pete Adler to uh, present this award to the city council. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Pete Adler, and I'm the, I'm the Colorado chapter delegate to the American Public Works Association. On behalf of the board of directors of the Colorado chapter of APWA, I'm here tonight to recognize the city of Longmont for the Dickens Farm Nature Area. 
This is the 35th year the Colorado chapter has recognized outstanding achievements and in individuals in public works in Colorado through our awards program. Project categories are administrative, disaster emergency construction, environment, operations and maintenance, parks and trails, public outreach, structures, sustainability, and transportation. We also recognize a number of professional managers in different public works disciplines. The criteria for these awards is to, share, to include innovation for a better way to serve the public or internal customers. Did the public project achieve all set goals? Can other communities and situations learn from this project? And was there cooperation with multiple parties to achieve the set goals? The project we are recognizing is the Dickens Farm Nature Area. This is the type of project that the Colorado chapter is proud to recognize in the multiple, uh, for using a large area for multiple, pur multiple purposes. As I understand the project, the planning process for this multi-use park di district park, now called nature area, was nearly 20 years ago. Some of the park areas and amenities were completed in 2004 and the city was planning on moving back to finish the work on the project site in mid 2010s. However, with the record September rains and flooding in 2013, staff rethought the use of the area and not only completed a great open space area with many recreational opportunities, but also use the area for future flood mitigation. This is a dynamic use of development that was supplemented as a separate need arose. Now I worked for City of Arvada for over 30 years and in the middle of Arvada is the Majestic View Park. Majestic View Park is a multi-use park and nature area in the middle of the city. As Longmont grows and expands, you'll have the Dickens Farm nature area will continue to be a great open space oasis in the middle of the city and Longmont did an extraordinary job in developing this public nature area. So therefore on the behalf of the Colorado chapter of the American Public Works Association, I want to congratulate the city of Longmont for the Dickens Farm nature area for their, for their Colorado Parks and Trails project of the year. I also want to add this is the type of project that APWA looks to recognize on a national level and the Colorado chapter is here to assist you with submission for national project of the year uh, consideration in this area. And finally, we at the Colorado chapter of American Public Works Association wanna thank all public works field workers for their continual efforts working for the public throughout this pandemic. Good job guys, good job. I, the only question I have, those slot, where, those, those people swimming and whatnot, is that like the same water quality as Union? Is it before or after the, the final water treatment? So water quality in that stretch of the river, Mayor, is above the wastewater treatment plant. Okay. Um, so I would say it's, it's probably superior to or similar to what is in Union. Okay, yes. all right, cool. I'm just curious. Yes. And then, um, and uh, how long has that been open? Uh, Mayor Bagley, City Council, we had uh, a soft opening in March of this year, and so we were working on punch list issues for three or four months, but um, the public was using it from March on. And is that area the whitewater rafting, so to speak? Uh, it is the Longmont St. Vrain float course. We Right, but we don't do whitewater luxury rafting. Luxury of gradient to uh, call it a whitewater, but we're calling it a no, float. That's why, because we were talking about kayaking. But that is the kayaking, right? Uh, Mayor Bagley, City Council, I have seen kayakers, I've seen paddle boarders, I've seen tubers, okay. I've seen floaters, I've seen fishermen. So I've seen a lot of multiple uses on that. Okay. Cool. It looks beautiful. Thank you, guys. Well Thank deserved. You. Right, Great project. Congratulations. Council yep. Councilmember Peck. Thank you. Thank you, staff. It, it's it's a beautiful area. I love going out there and cycling around it on the way to uh, on the way to Sandstone. So um, thank you very much. Well deserved. It's it's going to be a gym in our community. It's great. Thank you. Okay, then mm -hmm. uh, that said, let's uh, go ahead and take a three minute break. And we're going to go ahead and get all if you if you want to talk at first call public invited to be heard. Now is the time dial that number. And uh, let's talk. Back in three.
Something is wrong with my screen, but can you guys see me? All right. So I can't see any of you, but let's get started. Let's go ahead with first call, public invited to be heard. Oh, there I am. All right. So let's go ahead. How many callers we got, first of all? Well, we have quite a few, Mayor. Give me just a minute and I'll give you a count. Okay. Looks like we have 16. And okay. I'm just waiting for the slide to clear our live stream, which it did. And I'll begin with the first caller. Your phone number ends in 665. I'm going to ask you to unmute 665. Yes, good evening. This is Matt Eldred. Uh, my address is 318 Carter Lane here in Longmont. I'm calling tonight. Uh, I am the executive director for TLC Learning Center, the Tiny Tim Learning Center, a 65 year old nonprofit early childhood program here in Longmont. Calling tonight to thank uh, City Council for the um, generous support. In 2020, you allocated a little over $200,000 for expanding early childhood services, specifically for professional development uh, in 2020. And then COVID happened, and uh, those funds have been redirected to uh, providing PPE supplies and leveraging those funds to be able to uh, make sure that early childhood programs and early childhood centers are open and able to open safely with those supplies. So I wanted to thank you for your quick and swift movement uh, with those funds earlier uh, in 2020 and throughout the year as we've been able to reopen. Uh, I know that that uh, comes under Karen Roney and Christina Pacheco Sims and then Olga Bermudez with the Bright Eyes program. And that money has kind of been funneled and um, folks have been asked to contact Olga for those usable supplies, which has really been a huge help to be able to, to open and stay open for early childhood programs so that we can continue to um, provide services for our youngest residents here in Longmont. Also wanted to thank uh, City Council and especially Harold is, um, he's looking at the CARES Act funds that we're trying to spend through the end of 2020. And those funds, hopefully some of those will be able to be used for early childhood programs to make sure that they remain open, again, so that we can provide services for some of our vulnerable and most vulnerable residents in Longmont, and especially some of those folks that you were talking about earlier, that some of our essential workers that need to be working in Longmont to be able to provide services, they have to have places for their children to go. And so we're really uh, thankful to the city for the foresight of being able to direct some of those funds to early childhood programs. And I'm sure you'll probably hear from others tonight uh, how that has impacted them as well. So thank you for your support. Uh, and uh, please let us know if there's anything that we can do in terms of uh, providing you data and feedback on uh, what those um, supplies are going to uh, to provide services for children in Longmont. Thank you. All right, thank you, Matt. All right, next call. All right, our next caller, your phone number ends in 045. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Zero four five. You may want to try hitting star six, that might help you. There you are. Okay, can you hear me? I sure can. You may begin. Okay, um, yeah, my name is Maria Villagran, and I've been a, a state licensed child care. Um, Boulder County provider and um, first of all, of all I want to thank you for um, the PPE protection stuff that you've given us to um, to eliminate a lot of our of our um, to create a uh, to create a, a safer area and um, safer workplace and healthier work area for our children as these supplies come in their beneficiary to all of us it keep helps us to keep our business uh, cleaner and from the minute the children walk into our daycare um, from the one minute to the next throughout the day at, at the end and then when they're gone and then we have to sanitize and um, it's been a tremendous help for the hardworking high-end childcare providers. And um, 
It also helps eliminate for a lot of the providers that have been out looking for stuff that, you know, some of us, we share a lot of our stuff and we keep in contact with each other. If, you know, if somebody finds like Lysol or Lysol wipes or whatever, um, gloves, and one of us don't have any, we go out and just kind of share our stuff. And this picking up just one lump or bulk in, a, in one area is really handy and we don't have to be going like out all over the place and doing less traveling and less being out in public looking for all the stuff that we need to. So thank you. We appreciate all that. And um, it, again, it helps keep us safer. And um, and I just want to say that it helps our business to stay cleaner. And although some of us are limited to just certain toys and, you know, it's not lim we're not limited to learning, but just to keep um, healthy and keep our children as healthy as we can. So thank you so much. And that's okay. thank you all I really call. have. We appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. The next caller, your phone number ends in 584. 584. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hello. Hello. You may begin. Hi, good evening, Council. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to call in and share our voices. My name is Elizabeth Fannin, 1445 Serenity Circle, a Longmont resident. I'm also the director of the Aspen Center for Child Development, a nonprofit early childhood education setting um, for children six weeks to six years old. We're also a part of the Our Center, a family resource center. And I wanted to call in and really give my sincere thanks for all the PPE equipment and support the city has offered us um, throughout 2020 in the COVID pandemic. Uh, it's definitely um, brought some relief to our school, um, some comfort and sense of security to the, the parents and the teachers knowing that we're able to follow the cleaning and disinfecting protocols uh, from the pub public health department and really maintaining a high level of uh, safe and, and healthy spaces for our entire uh, community. So thank you very much. Um, I'd be happy to help in any way that I can, providing information that you need to make other decisions and uh, really am just so, so grateful for your support. So thank you. Thank you. And, and to the other callers, uh, the best way you could probably thank us is just to say thank you quickly for the PPE. Um, I'm, I'm serious. If you've got, I mean, just, just let you know that uh, uh, I'm not saying that you're not, you shouldn't call and you shouldn't say anything. Um, we've just got a busy schedule tonight. And so um, everybody should have the opportunity to say what they're going to say. But if there's 15 people going to say thank you for three minutes, um, I know the biggest thank you would be, would be a quick thank you. So, all right, let's go. Next caller. The next caller, your phone number ends in 396. 396, I'm going to ask you to unmute. All right, can you hear me? This is Scott at the uh, Longmont Chamber. Hi, Scott. Yes, you may begin. All right. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. Again, Scott Cook at the Longmont Chamber, 528. Uh, and like the other callers before, I was calling to thank the City Council for the funds for PPE for our early childhood providers. So I will keep it short as the mayor uh, requested, but um, just from my role, I've spoken with a number of employees who are, employers, sorry, who are doing their best to uh, work around their employees' new schedules, um, which can be very difficult. So keeping our childhood care providers uh, open and having the proper PPE for them is uh, vital for us during this pandemic and uh, our economy is obviously very interconnected and it's very important that uh, we have these services so that our working families can uh, work as, as well as they can uh, during this time. So just wanted to pass along our thanks from the chamber as well. Thanks, Scott. All right, and our next caller, your phone number ends in three, two, two. Um, I do not see that caller on our list. The next one is 887. 
and I do not see that one listed here as well. And the next one is 142. And that is not one of the ones we were expecting. So I will go down the rest of the list. Caller that ends in 180. I'm going to ask you to unmute. 180. Are you there? Oh, that may be another person uh, that is with another item. 470. Let's try you. 470. I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you are. Hi there. Thank you. Michael Belmont here at 841 Tenacity Drive. Thank you, Mayor and Council members. It is common knowledge that in 2012, Longmont citizens voted overwhelmingly to for an initiative to ban fracking within the city limits. Though the Colorado Supreme Court overturned that ban in 2016, in 2019, the Colorado legislature passed SB 181, giving far greater power to municipalities to regulate fracking within their borders and elevating health and safety of citizens over the promotion of fracking. That bill did not preclude a ban as a means to regulate. Naturally, the group that spearheaded the initiative, Our Health, Our Future, Our Longmont, has, with the help of attorney Joe Salazar and Colorado Rising, sought to restore the will of the people in Longmont by reviving the fracking ban in light of SB 181. However, in recent days, Councilpersons Waters and Martin have written opinions scolding Mr. Salazar, Colorado Rising, and by implication, Longmont citizens that support Our Health, Our Future, Our Longmont in honoring the voice of all those citizens that voted to ban fracking. Waters and Martin claim that we are magically safe from the ill effects of fracking because of one agreement with one operator promising not to drill on the surface within city limits, when there are scores of potential drillers in Colorado that would happily do so. This does not secure our future. Only the ban that passed overwhelmingly in 2012 by their fellow citizens can do that. We believe it is better to have full protection to perpetuity than the tepid so-called protection they tout that is subject to the vagaries of time. Waters and Martin whine about spending too much money on this effort. Based on council member Martin's claim that it cost the city $358,000 over eight years, given our population, that equates to $3.60 total per person over those years, which is just 75 pennies per year per person spent on behalf of protecting the health of our entire population and to uphold a mandate of a compelling majority of voters to ban fracking. So tell me, Dr. Waters and Ms. Martin, what price would you put on the health of your neighbors, your children, and your me, family? Mr. Belmont, you're out of order. Yes. You have, you have to address the chair. Indeed, every Longmont citizen, or, or are we simply number? I mean, is this, what price would you put? Is this, are we just numbers in an accounting exercise with the goal to maximize the bottom line? So please don't give us yet another sermon about how one contract with one operator will protect us or that we have spent too much money, 45 cents per citizen per year, toward truly and permanently securing the health and safety of our children, our elders, and yes, you and every one of us in this fair town. Thank you, Mr. Thank Belmont. You. Thank you. All right, first caller. The next caller is 499. Your phone number ends in 499. I'm going to ask you okay. to... Okay. Can you hear me? I can. You may begin. Okay. Thank you. And this is Doe Kelly of Barberry Drive, and I would like to say something about COVID and vitamin D. Um, as we're heading into more safer at home guidelines and lockdowns with more and more people being economically harmed, my sister, who is a physician's assistant, has sent me the following report that I would like to share with you, uh, titled, New Study Suggests Vitamin D Deficiency is Linked to Severe COVID-19. Quote, a recent study has found that more than 80% of approximately 200 COVID patients in the Spanish hospital were deficient in vitamin D. This research seems to support a previous study that indicated an apparent correlation between vitamin D deficiency and an 
increased risk of acquiring COVID-19. The new study published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism found that 82.2% of the 216 COVID patients studied were vitamin D deficient. It was discovered that patients with lower vitamin D levels had also higher levels of inflammatory markers that had been associated with worse outcomes in COVID patients. Useful in COVID-19 patients and the general population is vitamin D's ability to support the immune system and fight infection by repelling harmful bacteria and viruses, and it also works to balance the immune system. Low levels of vitamin D have been linked with frequent colds and flu, end quote. And I note the common cold is indeed a coronavirus, and we've all had them. Now, I'd like to ask, why are people in positions of governmental health authority not telling the population on a broad basis to do such things as take extra vitamin D3, C, zinc, and so on as preventive measures to COVID? Furthermore, why have such esteemed nutritional experts as Andrew W. Saul, PhD, and others been actively censored from the get-go, from the likes of Facebook, among other, when they share this message? Why would our own health authorities withhold this truth from the population in favor of a future vaccine that certain specific vitamins and minerals can be highly protective from COVID and that no one needs to die, so nobly espoused by the frontline doctors who then were promptly censored? I hope you will take these questions to heart and then please provide publicly strong leadership in widely promoting already proven natural proactive countermeasures against this scourge whose survival rate is between 95 and 99 percent depending on age and comorbidities. Most people do not die of COVID in spite of what we have been widely programmed to believe. And I will send you all the article containing this study. Congratulations on your award. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for hitting three minutes exactly. All right, next caller. The next caller, your phone number ends in 511. I'm gonna ask you to unmute 511. There you are. Hello? Yes. You may begin. Okay, yes, hi, my name is Gail Allen and I live in the Greens here in Longmont. And uh, I listen, this is about the uh, COVID numbers, the rising numbers. My concern was that I think that there is some confusion or ambiguity on when to wear masks when you're outdoors. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was walking down Main Street between 3rd and 9th, the business district. And I passed a dozen different people um, on the sidewalks, through the crosswalks, and only one was actually wearing a mask. Um, one had it on their chin. Um, so the question is, if you're not wearing a mask and you can't social distance, you know, that's, uh, people feel if they're outdoors, they don't need to wear a mask. I've also seen that even on golf courses uh, where they're golfing and they figure they're outside, so it doesn't matter if they share a cart or walk together. So what I'm asking of um, city council is if they might be able to uh, strongly suggest to our residents that they carry a mask when they're outside. So if you do come across people and you can't socially distance, at least you have that mask you can slip on and wear until you're socially distanced. Uh, I hope that would help to reduce our numbers. So, and thank you for all your efforts. Thank you, ma'am. All right, next call. The next caller, your phone number ends in 525. Five. I'm gonna ask you to unmute 525. There you are. Hello. Um, this is Laurel Ritchie. I'm a realtor in Longmont, and I just wanted to speak on behalf of realtors and the residents of Longmont again. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you guys for all the long nights you're putting in, because I realize it's a big deal now that I've been watching these for a while. Um, but I did want to talk about property rights again, and it, it regarding the Airbnb uh, as 
I've said before, I know that it's not popular among some people on the council, um, but determining the use of a person's property seems extremely big brotherish. Um, letting the market decide what people want seems the reasonable thing to do, and Airbnbs are not going to be going anywhere soon. People love them. They love staying in them over hotels. And so many people that stay in Airbnbs or Longmont are relatives of somebody living nearby. I hear that is a huge part of who's staying there. Um, and I watched a zoning board meeting not too long ago. And what I realized, a really big difference between yours and that, they had to state if they knew or, or had any contact with the person who was applying for something which seems like a really um, transparent way to deal with this kind of thing because some of the people promoting the limiting of the Airbnb, I know live very close to the trouble house, the quote unquote party house. And it would be nice if people were to disclose why, what their motivations were by saying, you know, I'm friends with this person who has to live behind a party house, quote unquote party house. Um, that same sort of transparency would be nice. And I know this was a discussion even last week about transparency. You guys like to know who is calling in and not have anonymous people, but yet your relationship with these people is not transparent to us as the public. And it's making a big difference. You know, this could potentially affect um, maybe now just a handful of these houses, but maybe a ton later on. And I have seen the photos of what kind of signs Pearl posted in her backyard facing up towards the Airbnb. One of them said, um, we don't like having an Airbnb in our backyard. Um, don't talk to us. Don't look at us. And another one had big eyeballs on it and said, we're watching you. Um, this is not what a good neighbor does. Uh, it, the type of response she would prompt from the people who see those you know, it's not going to be positive. So she's not being a good neighbor. And whether a person's a short-term person or a long-term renter or um, even an owner, that's not the kind of neighborly thing that I would expect to be happening in Longmont. So if these Airbnbs are going to be eliminated, I think it's only fair for the people involved to disclose how they are related to these people because we are only talking about one trouble house and that's all thank you all right bye thank you ma'am all right next the next caller your phone number ends in five nine three i'm going to ask you to unmute five there you are hi hi you may begin Good evening, Mayor Bagley and Longmont City Council. My name is Beth Anderson, and I live at 421 Gay Street. I'm calling about the short-term rental ordinance you'll be discussing during tonight's meeting. My husband, Tom, and I own a home two blocks away that we operate as a short-term rental through the Airbnb platform. Longmont's short-term rental ordinance is a powerful document in its current form. It protects our neighborhoods from trust, LLCs and investment companies purchasing homes to operate as STRs and, and not being present to manage the property. It requires investment property STR owners to live within the city and only allows one per individual. Many cities didn't have the foresight to enact limitations on STRs before they got out of hand, but Longmont did and your planning staff has reported that there are minimal problems with the operation of them here. This ordinance should be shored up by perhaps limiting the number of permits and giving code enforcement the power to revoke a permit if there are valid violations. With these current limitations, only 12 permits for investment STRs have been issued since the inception of this ordinance. 12 is a small number when you talk about 33,406 households the city website says we have here in Longmont. That's fewer than four ten thousandths of the rooftops in the city. That's tiny. On the other hand, 12 is a huge number. When we talk about our city council shutting down businesses that they gave the green light to less than two years ago, let alone during the middle of a pandemic. 
if you change this ordinance in the proposed manner, that is exactly what you'll be doing. I've lived in Longmont my entire life. Tom is a farmer who has lived in the city for 29 years in Boulder County his whole life. He plans to retire soon, and we are counting on the income from this small business we started to supplement his Social Security. We have time, money, and heart wrapped up in this venture. I implore you to consider other solutions like limiting the number of investment STR permits or charging additional fees that would be dedicated to helping the homeless in our town. At the very least, consider grandfathering those who have already have permits into the updated ordinance. Please do not put us out of business when there is absolutely no local data to support this drastic change. Thank you for your time. All right, next caller. All right, the next caller, your phone number ends in 722. 722, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Hi, Mayor Hi. and Council Members. Yeah, you ready for me to go? Of course, you may begin. Yeah. My name is Lynette McLean and I live on Sandpoint Drive in Longmont. And I rep I'm representing the Longmont Citizens for Climate Watch tonight. I was disappointed by Councilman Waters and Councilwoman Martin's recent letters to the editor supporting fracking in the city of Longmont. I cannot understand why either one of them would take this stance, which is the complete opposite of their previous stance. They both ran for election to the city council as against fracking and both have supported the climate action resolution to prevent climate change. Councilwoman Martin serves on the Northern Colorado Partners for Clean Energy and the Colorado Re Renewable Energy Society. Both of their letters to the editor were riddled with misguided exaggerations. First off, Joe Salazar is the legal counsel representing Our House, Our Future, Our Longmont, a local group who is asking the courts to put the fracking ban back into place in Longmont. The case was tried in district court, one court, and is now on the way to the Colorado Court of Appeals. Since both council members Waters and Martin were elected to represent the city of Longmont, it's inappropriate for them to take a position against fracking. It's okay to personally be in favor of frack fracking, but in 20, 2012, 60% of the Longmont citizens voted for the charter amendment banning fracking in the city. This charter amendment is still in place and it's up to the city to uphold our, law, our laws. Senate Bill 181 allows cities to be more restrictive with oil and gas activity. Fracking has an economic effect of lowering property values, but most importantly, adversely affects our health. Research indicates that fracking as close as one and a half miles from residences can cause birth defects and cancer. In a Pennsylvania study, radioactivity was measured as far away as 12 miles from fracking sites. Drilling back under homes and lakes as is being done at Union Reservoir is also dangerous and can make our drinking water unpotable. Union Reservoir, originally called Calkins Lake, was carved out during the last glacial age and is one of only a few natural lakes left in Colorado. In 1903, the Union Ditch Company began drilling a tunnel to release water into the St. Rain River. According to Colorado Water Law, that made Union a true reservoir. Horizontal drilling, such as what is being done at Union Reservoir, is susceptible to leaks and explosions and can contaminate the air, ground, and water. Perhaps the council members have been brainwashed by local developers who have retained the mineral rights under their housing developments, but please assure to the, those developers that it's not likely that the citizens of Longmont will allow gas and oil activity under their residences. If you don't want to support a ban on fracking, you can simply throw away the mailers requesting donations and don't take it personally. If you're interested in putting the original fracking ban back in place in Longmont, you can donate to Colorado Rising at corising.org. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right. That's three minutes. Thank you. All right. Next caller. And I just want his chair to say that I admire the discipline of council members Waters and Martin. The next caller, your phone number ends in 819. 819, I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you are. Good evening. I'm Tom Anderson. I live at 421 Gay Street. My wife, Beth, and I own and operate an Airbnb at 906 Fifth Avenue, a block and a half from our house. We've been in operation for 14 months. Things are going well. 
Most of our guests are people from out of state visiting family in Longmont. A lot of grandparents visiting their kids and grandkids who live here or kids whose parents live here but have no room for them to stay with them. During this pandemic, it's been a safe haven away from a hotel setting where they can isolate and feel safe to be around their families. In fact, we have some grandparents coming in January for three months for the sole reason for helping their kids school their grandkids. We opened our Airbnb following all the stringent guidelines Airbnb requires and all the protocols the city requires according to ordinance, which by the way, I feel is an excellent example of how well the planning department did devising it. They are true professionals. This ordinance has only been in place for 20 months and seems to be working well. There are only 12 investment Airbnbs in the whole city. 12 individuals who have invested their time and money into these small businesses. I'm 66 years old. I was born and raised in Longmont. Fourth generation, as a matter of fact. Operating this small business is a block and a half away from where I live as part of my retirement plans. I think it is very unfair that the city would take that away from me. Seems you should encourage small business, not shut it down. Thank you, sir. Next caller. All right, our last caller, your phone number ends in 401. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Are you there? 401. Hello, my name is Susan Green. I live on Western Sky Circle in the Harvest Junction Village neighborhood. Um, first, I wanna say thank you to Mayor Bagley and the council people for allowing me to speak and um, also for responding to my emails. And also the COVID reporting earlier is sober, sobering and definitely puts things in perspective. <laughs> um, I'm calling about the Costco development that is uh, up for discussion later today on Ken Pratt Boulevard. And I just wanted to say that before we purchased our home in Harvest Junction Village, we did our due diligence. We looked at all the uh, planning documents and we understood that gravel mines were permitted and it was pretty much a done deal that those gravel mines would be there. <clears throat> with the end result being uh, remediation to Golden Pond-like park. Um, so you can understand that we're a little disappointed to have that done deal kind of changed at the last minute. And now we will have a big concrete building behind our house. <laughs> um, I understand and support the Longmont economics and diversity. I'm a longtime Longmont resident and we definitely support this in the community. Uh, I think that neighbors that I've discussed this with, all we are really asking for is consideration that additional and sufficient landscaping or visual barriers be put in place uh, so that we do not have our property values uh, affected by this and the light pollution, traffic, and auditory impacts of having a large warehouse behind us don't affect our daily lives. So thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. All right, next. Mayor, that's all the calls for tonight. All right, great. We all doing okay? Can we go through the consent agenda quick? We doing all right? All right, let's keep going. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I'll take that as an absolutely, let's rock on. All right, do you wanna go ahead and read the consent agenda for us? You bet, Mayor. Item 9A1 is Resolution 2020-122, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving a cooperative agreement between the City and the Longmont Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 6 for January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2021. 9A2 is Resolution 2020-123, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving a cooperative agreement between the City and the Longmont Professional Firefighters Association, International Association of Firefighters, Local 1806, for January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2021. 
sorry, 9B is resolution 2020-124, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Adams State University for a memorandum of affiliation permitting educational experiences and counseling. 9C is resolution 2020-125, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and the County of Boulder for the acquisition and management of the McLaughlin property. 9D is resolution 2020-126, a resolution of the Council of the City of Longmont, Colorado, finding that the petition for annexation of a parcel of land located in Boulder County, State of Colorado, known as the River Set Annexation, generally located north of Boston Avenue and east of Sunset Street, substantially complies with the Colorado Revised Statute Section 31-12-1071. And 9E is resolution 2020-127, a, res a resolution of the Longmont City Council supporting public health agencies in slowing the spread of COVID-19. Councilmember Peck, I'm sorry, Councilmember Christensen. Um, I would like to pull item um, B and E items. All right, I'm gonna move the consent agenda, less item B and E. Councilmember Waters? Uh, I'd like to pull item A. All right, I'm gonna withdraw my motion and I'm gonna move the consent agenda, uh, less A, B, and E. Second. Second. All right, all in favor of passage of the consent agenda, specifically C and D only, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Aye. All right, uh, the, the motion carries unanimously. All right, um, let's go back and look at, let's start with just an order. Item A, Dr. Waters, do you want to start? You can start by- I'm sorry, meeting. yeah, thank you. My question uh, is, is really not about, because I, I, I took it off the agenda because I didn't know when to ask this question. It's not about uh, the agreement with the fire department or the police department. Um, my question really is for Harold, and it's uh, about where we are, because so much of the agreement is about protecting the rights of, of employees, as it should be. Um, but I know we're in the process of reseeding uh, the citizen review panel or the citizen over, oversight panel. I'm just curious where we are with that process. And if something were to emerge, uh, requiring their services, do we have a panel that to that we could we could call to respond? Um, and is that a new panel? Is that a former panel? You know, what's the status of all that? We have the existing panel that's in place for those issues that we've been dealing with now. I'm trying to look at my schedule. I think I go into. Um, at some point this week, I have a meeting to where we, we go through the applications that we've, so we've solicited applications. I have a panel that I'm working with to go through those applications uh, Friday afternoon. Thank you, Joni. I knew it was on my, so Friday afternoon, we're going to meet to go over those applications. And then um, I believe it's the first week of December after Thanksgiving where we go through and do the interviews. Um, and so you'll, so in the interim, if something were to come up, you'd have the existing panel. Existing, the existing panel. Uh, thanks. Um, with that information, I'll move uh, approval of 9A. Uh, and I, I can't see my screen because this, thank you. Um, in resolutions 2020-122 and 2020-123. Second. All right, it's been moved by Dr. Waters and second by Council Member Peck. All in favor say ah. Point of order. Yes, go ahead. Should we, since we've pulled these out, take them one at a time as let's far just, as motions let's just, are? Let's just do it to be safe. All right. We're going to vote on resolution 2020 122. We're going to divide the motion. All in favor of passage of resolution 2020 122. Say aye. 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 Suppose, say nay. All right. Resolution 2020 122 passes unanimously. And the second part of the motion, resolution 2020 123, all in favor of passage, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. The motion also carries, uh, that motion also carries unanimously. Let's move on to B, Councilmember Christensen. The floor is yours. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, sometimes we pay people for internships. Um, I would like to know whether they're being paid for this internship.
doesn't look like they are in the in the um, <clears throat> in the agreement. And I just like to point out, as I always do, that when you don't pay people, then the only the only students who can do this are people who have money and not people who are out trying to actually have to work to pay their bills to go to school. So it's discriminatory. Mayor, Council Member Christensen, Teresa Tate, Deputy City Attorney here. I do not believe that, um, that this provides for payment for those internships. I believe it is a requirement of their program. We have a longstanding relationship um, with this university and this program. Um, but so in answer to your question, I do not believe that, it, that they are paid. I guess I would, I would also say that, I mean, uh, if we have all internships required to be paid, a lot of people wouldn't get internships. My, my firm provides internships to high school kids. Trust me, I do not need or want high school kids in my firm, uh, but it gives them the opportunity to at least be around and kind of see what lawyers are like. Um, and if you said, you gotta pay them, they wouldn't be in my firm because they're losing me. I mean, I lose money by having him present. But in this case, we don't need to debate it because it sounds like it's part of an educational requirement. So do you wanna make a motion, Councilmember Christensen? Or do you want me to? No, I'll move it because we always do this, but I'm just pointing out that no matter what, it still means that it's discriminatory. Um, <laughs> okay, I move uh, resolution 2020-124. I'll second it. All right, all in favor of resolution 2020-124, saying no for the debate, say aye. 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 Opposed, say, opposed say nay. All right, resolution 2020-124 passes unanimously. All right, let's move on to resolution 2020-127. I was gonna pull that as well. Council Member Christensen. Okay, well, I don't mean to be such a mom, but you know, one of the things we, we seem to have forgotten about is washing our hands. That's one of the main ways that things get spread around. We all like to touch stuff. We like to touch each other. This isn't helpful. So it, it, I'm just saying that it would have been nice to have in this resolution something about washing your hands because removing the, using soap and detergent to uh, remove the fat layer of COVID is one of the most effective ways to keep it down. So anyway, but um, other than that, I would move um, passage of resolution 2020-127. I'll second that. I guess the only thing I wanted to say is what I, uh, my frustration in the very beginning with the pandemic was just like some people would refuse to acknowledge the threat of the virus. Uh, many, um, you know, many would just uh, fail to see the detrimental impacts on the economy and other issues and secondary consequences. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out. To go the governor, I thought, did a great job with what he presented today. Um, it's taking into account both concerns. And uh, I don't know about other people, but I lose a lot of sleep trying to figure out how in the world is an individual, a business owner, a politician, a father, just as a person who has elderly parents and does not want them dead or sick, um, what do you do? You know, so I thought he walked a pretty fine line today. And, um, and uh, hopefully uh, we've got a virus on the way. So um, we'll keep pushing through. So. All right, let's take a vote. All in favor of resolution 2020-127, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, resolution 2020-127 passes unanimously. All right, let's move on to, um, actually, let's go ahead and take a brief two minute break. And uh, I I'm sorry about that, I skipped this. But let's go ahead and take a two minute break for public hearing to consider action on amendment 20-02 uh, to the 2020 CDBG Act action plan. I don't think we're going to have anybody, so stay close to your computer and we'll start right at three minutes. Thanks.
All right, you ready to keep going? Is anybody on the line for public hearing? No, Mayor, I do not see anybody that has called in. All right, then I'm gonna go ahead and move uh, Amendment 2020-02 to the 2020 CDBG Action Plan and close the public hearing. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, great. Let's move on to item 12. Um, before we jump in, so um, depending on how long this takes, I was told by city staff that they can pull item C and D um, and push it to next week. Um, we'll need 851, however, so we'll see how this goes. Um, I guess it would also, um, as we start to talk about the Costco economic development plan and the incentives, um, keep in mind A, um, that we've all been in on these meetings as city council members as, we're, as we've been going along. Two, um, there is a fantastic backstory piece that's available on Longmont Public Media if the, if, the, if the public would like to know more about the history of the project. And three, um, just be mindful that, um, you know, this could easily go on forever. So continue, Harold, your turn. Yeah, Mayor Council. Um... This is, um, we have a, a fair amount of slides, but we're going to try to move through those with some pace to kind of talk about the project and, and provide um, some of the information. So Susan, if you can um, bring that up. Tonight, we have several folks joining us. Uh, I can't, we have representatives from Costco. Um, Jennifer Murillo will be presenting uh, on their behalf, representatives from the Golden family. Um, and the development team that's been working on this. Uh, the, the presentations primarily from a staff perspective are going to be uh, me. We're gonna have Jessica present a slide on ancillary economic impacts. Dale's gonna talk about the, the, the deal structure and Jim's gonna talk about the financials. Uh, at the same time, we also have Eugene, Carolyn White and others here to answer any questions. Next slide, please. So the, the first part that we want to start off with is how did this opportunity develop and why is it important to our community? Um, we think this is important to talk about with council today in order to provide some uh, perspective on the process that we went through. Um, can say this has been something that we've been working on for over a year. I don't know how much over a year, but over a year. Next slide. So what happened here, what happened in Longmont, we were approached by a developer um, with the potential of locating Costco in Longmont. Um, there were a number of issues that really came out with that um, original location, um, primarily from an infrastructure and financial perspective. And when we evaluated it, the developer needed 18 to 23 million to make the deal work for them to meet the Costco requirements. And I wanna be very clear. These were not Costco requirements for the 18 to 23 million. These were the requirements that the developer had to have in order to meet some of those requirements associated with the infrastructure and financial challenges at this location. Next slide, please. Um, so we realized we needed a new location uh, based on the, the infrastructure and economics there. Um, we knew that Costco wanted to locate a store in the Longmont area, but we also knew that Longmont area, not meaning Longmont. And so we knew there were locations outside of Longmont's municipal boundaries. And we knew there were locations being considered in communities to our east. And, and so we needed to assist Costco in finding a location that met their needs. Um, what we actually did, um, to be very clear, we didn't pick a particular location. We set a bunch of options based on what we knew the space requirements would be. Costco said, this is the location we wanna, we wanna pick based on um, their requirements and what they're looking for in a site. Um, next slide. Um, back, I mean, so when they picked the location, I wanna take this opportunity um, to thank um, Reggie Golden and the Golden family because they actually, um, when, when we presented these different sites, um, it was, as we all know, planned uh, for a different use. And, and so, you know, we called Reggie and we said, we have an opportunity in Longmont. Um, this is a location um, that uh, we wanna, that they wanna utilize. And would you be willing to entertain that conversation? 
a lot of people don't have to do that. And um, I think um, their commitment to our community um, and just uh, helping us, you know, fulfill, uh, helping us with these types of opportunities is a testament to what they've done. And I just want to thank them for that because uh, it's not something that a lot of people will do is change what they're planning midstream to look at something else. So I just wanted to, to say thank you. We also, in terms of these types of deal structures, because I know there's some, been some questions about, so why do we do this? Um, I will say this is consistent in terms of um, the Costco requirements and you'll, on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about that. But we also looked, and this is public information that was presented. Um, if you see the last project, the Denver Flyway project, this was actually a presentation that they made. Um, and it was a similar project in, in 2020. And so um, this was in, in, in their public slides, but really you can see that this type of structure is consistent in the different communities. Um, Parker in 2009, 11.6 million, Denmouth in 14, uh, 14 million, Thornton uh, 3.47, it's a TIF, slightly different, and then the Denver Flyway project at 9.5 million. So you can see consistency in the type of deals. I wanna again be very clear it's about having the site ready for development and the utilities up to the pad site. So that is that development cost that's associated with it. Next slide, please. Um, so what are the benefits of locating Costco in Longmont? Um, first and foremost, um, we know that it will reduce our retail leakage. It was interesting for me to see the social media components um, that we saw on Nextdoor and all the social media platforms. And how many people in our community said, hey, we don't have to drive to, you know, to these other locations. So for us, that's a big component. Um, as we know from the world we're in now from an economic perspective, um, that's important to weather these storms. It also protects our existing sales tax base. And this is a, an important point for us because when we talked about the fact that there are other locations outside of our jurisdiction, we knew that Costco is one of the few if, and I can only think of two, what I would say retail destinations in terms of where people drive to go to, that, to, go to their, their stores, we knew that that would pull people from Longmont, pull other retail opportunities with them. And so we really knew we had to do that to, to actually keep the existing sales tax in our community. Same time, we knew that it would increase our existing sales tax base. And, and this is one of the few times that um, I've been in an economic development deal where it's, it's not just looking at what you can gain, it's also looking at what you can potentially lose if it locates outside of your community. Um, creates well-paying jobs. Jennifer is going to jump in and talk about, um, you know, the Costco story, but um, when we look at it, they really, the way they structure their, their salary benefits, it really actually looks more like a primary employer than a typical retailer. Um, it brings, you've heard me say this once, a destination retailer to Longmont. That's not something that we, we really have at this point, and it definitely does that, which also expands our retail trade area. And so we've looked at a couple of things. Next slide. So when we look at this, this is actually a map that we took um, that's on the website for the Village at the Peaks in terms of what they consider the retail trade area. Um, and then in different conversations, we said, so what does that potentially look like? We really think this is what it um, does to our retail trade area. Um, it, you know, we're not sure, but we're saying this is what we think it will do in terms of bringing people into our community. So you can obviously see that it makes a big difference and hits many of the points that I talked about earlier. Next slide. And so now I will actually turn it over to Jessica to talk about um, the, the Costco economic, economic impact from her perspective. Jessica. Sorry. Thank you, Harold. Um, so I'll just real quickly talk about uh, from an economic development perspective, we typically look at retail and primary industry projects very differently. Retail projects, we're typically looking at significant fiscal benefits, which you'll hear about the significant fiscal benefits, which are the direct uh, dollars into city coffers that uh, Costco location brings to the community. 
When we look at primary industry projects, we're more looking at the broad economic spinoff benefits in terms of job creation and wages that are paid by those jobs and then the spinoff jobs, the direct jobs and then the spinoff jobs that are created as a result. Costco is a unique project in that it has both significant fiscal and economic benefits. So as Harold mentioned, uh, looking more like a primary industry project when we consider the economic spinoff benefits of a Costco location here in Longmont. And what creates that are the number of jobs that are gonna be created uh, by the Costco location here, as well as the high average wages that are being paid and the new dollars that will be coming into our local economy through the expanded trade area that Harold just mentioned. So Costco estimates that they'll create 260 direct jobs in the first five years here in Longmont. Economic impact modeling suggests that with the multiplier effect of those jobs, that's an additional 74.3 spinoff jobs will be created locally, totaling 334.3 total jobs within Longmont. When we look at it from a wages perspective, Costco estimates that their annual wages will be $16.4 million with an average annual wage of over $58,000 per year, which is higher than the citywide average annual wage. We estimate through economic modeling that an additional $8.3 million in spinoff annual wages will be paid as a result of this project. So a total of nearly $25 million in annual wages paid as a result of the location of this project here. We also look at the investment, the capital investment that Costco will make in building and furniture fixtures and equipment in the facility, many of those dollars being spent here locally. We also recognize the significant fiscal contribution that the location of Costco and Longmont makes to the school district totaling about $6.3 million over the next 10 years. And that's net of any additional student costs related to additional employees moving into the region. Thanks, Jessica. Um, we're going to keep going with the presentation and we'll um, ask council if you have questions. We'll do that at the end, if that's okay. Uh, that's um, yes. Yep. So the other thing, uh, so one of the things that, that really impressed me is just looking at, um, again, Jessica touched on this, their salary structure as a, re as a retailer um, and being more um, commensurate with a, with a primary employer, but it's also really how they um, approach, um, how they treat their employees, how the, they invest in them, the benefits they provide. And, and then frankly, the thing that I heard from Jennifer is, is really how they look internally. Um, but let's um, go to the next slide and turn it over to Jennifer because she's the one that can really um, talk to you about their philosophy and, and, and I think it'll impress all of you. Jennifer? Hi. Can you guys hear me okay? Sorry, I just lost, hold on. Just. We can hear you. Okay, I just lost my view. Hold on a second. Um, okay, well, I'm just gonna roll with that. Thank you very much. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Um, thank, first of all, thank you, council, staff, and, and community members for inviting me to this today, for allowing me to talk about Costco. I've been asked to highlight some of the key issues and um, talk about what we, how we plan to operate in the city of Longmont. So, arranging a little bit. Um, Costco's goal is to provide the best possible values and lowest prices to our members by virtually eliminating all frills and costs associated with traditional retail. This includes everything from our concrete floors, exposed ceilings, and lack of commercial advertising. Where we don't cut costs is our employees because they make all the difference for our membership. Costco's competitive advantage has always been our corporate culture. And that culture is a reflection of our employees. And what does this mean? It means that we pick the best, we compensate them fairly, and we grow with them. As this last bullet point points out, 
um, community partnership is a very critical um, component of our strategy. Uh, we put a lot of thought into our location strategy because we view this as a long-term relationship. Um, as far as corporate giving, all of that stuff you can find on our website, costco.com with percentages and amounts and all that. But what I really like to highlight is our warehouse staff works directly with local nonprofits to donate not just goods and and materials, but their time. If you go on the website, costco.com, lower left-hand corner, um, there's, a, there's a section called um, sustainability commitment. And if you click on community, there's some really great information. There's a video with real Costco employees talking about the local community initiatives that they participate in. And I can tell you 100% those are real employees because one of those is our real estate admin. And it's a super cute video. So if you have time to check that out, um, it really gives a lot more information on this, but I'll speed it along because I know we have a lot going on today. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Um, I would like to thank staff for including this. Uh, this is just another something that we're very, very proud of. It's a reflection that um, all of the things we're putting into play are having the effect that we want. And that is creating a positive and supportive work environment for employees. Uh, next slide, please. So um, back to fair compensation. Um, one of the ways that this is reflected, as, as Harold said, we do pay among the highest wages in the retail industry. Uh, and one of the evidence of that is um, turnover rate. So 2019, the Bureau of Labor Statistics said that the average retail, uh, retail turnover rate was 58%. Um, as you can see here, our, our turnover rate is 13, which is a fraction of that. And if you dig a little deeper and you go after one year, that drops to 7%. And again, this is a huge measure of success for us because happy, happy employees stay. And this keeping great employees and growing with them is what saves us money and it improves the level of service in our warehouses. Um, it is also a great job for college students uh, who need to schedule around their classes. We offer flexibility. We offer um, incentives and um, tuition support, all kinds of things that um, are really beneficial. And finally, it's a great opportunity to grow with the company. When you start, you know, obviously we start at 18, you can move up throughout there. And because all promotional opportunities within the warehouse are filled from within. And that means that every executive we have an upper management, all of these people for the most part have grown up through the company. They know what it's like to work in a warehouse and they've moved up from their, to their current positions. So I think that's something that's really great. And that's something that is um, a big piece of our culture, our company culture. So um, can I get the next slide please? Um, finally, just to drive all of this home, you can see the statistics on the screen here. It all translates to one thing, which is livable wages and growth and opportunity. I should say opportunity. Um, one stat that's not shown here is that in fiscal year 2019, 90.3% of our employees were eligible for benefits. That's 268,000 employees, 90% coverage. Um, and of those employees, 97% of those chose to enroll. And why? Because they're really good benefits. I can say that I am an actual Costco employee covered by actual Costco benefits. And um, a family of that for a family of four or five, that's $167 a month. So um, that's huge. Um, I've talked to other people. And that's a pretty good coverage. And as a mother of a child with asthma, I can attest that this is a huge relief. It's one less thing that you have to worry about in a time when there is a lot to worry about. So um, just wanted to hit highlight on that. And uh, before I go, I'd like to thank um, staff, Reggie, 
everybody for um, you know welcoming us into the community and giving us this opportunity to become a part of the community. So thank you very much. And with that, I will pass the torch. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, who's next, Harold? Is that it? Dale. Mayor yeah. Bagley and members of council, uh, Dale Rademacher, can you go to the next slide? So mayor and council, I'm going to uh, take a few minutes here and just step through some of the uh, highlights and key elements of the particular uh, agreement that's in front of you. Um, I'm gonna start with um, some of what uh, staff has understood to be some of the expectations or needs of Costco. Um, as Harold noted, um, uh, there was only one location in Longmont that, that Costco uh, decided. Um, it, it's part of their culprit uh, culture to actually have their CEO come out and literally stand on the site and, and make the decision that this is in fact where they want to locate the store. Um, part of that effort also requires a, an agreement with the owner uh, to deliver that property at, at, at no cost to Costco. Um, and also uh, Costco is looking for pad ready sites. In other words, that the horizontal infrastructure, the water, the sewer, the roads have been built. And um, essentially what is delivered to them is a pad ready site where they can uh, then come in and, and uh, uh, construct their warehouse and facilities. Next slide. And again, the, the public-private partnership agreement or the P3 agreement, there's several key elements to it. I'm not going to uh, go through each and every one of these in detail, but suffice it to say, there is a component to the agreement wherein the city is acquiring uh, the 17 acres of uh, land for the Costco warehouse and fueling island. Uh, this agreement is also providing the city um, with a significant affordable housing opportunity again, through the acquisition of nine acres of property for that purpose. Um, the city is also um, bringing to the table, if you will, the satisfaction of the raw water deficits on the property. And the overall property is a 48.66 acre site. Uh, we're satisfying those water deficits in a variety of ways. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, as I had mentioned, uh, the public improvements are an expectation. And so the agreement that's in front of you also calls for a uh, sharing of the design and construction of the public improvements. And the city is also, um, I think of it as uh, sort of backing up the costs for the private site improvements. Uh, should those costs exceed the uh, contribution of funds being provided by Costco? Uh, the agreement has several clawback provisions that I'll talk about in a minute here. Uh, and again, those are, are to protect the city's investment in the project. And then finally, there's a, a timeline for the project initiation and ultimately a deadline for the opening of the Costco warehouse. Um, Costco is contributing 6.16 million uh, to, the, to the private site improvements. That is certainly in addition to the costs that they are going to expand obviously to, to build and furnish the warehouse in the fueling island. Next slide. As I mentioned, this is a, a 48 acre site. Uh, it's immediately south of Ken Pratt Boulevard and immediately east of the Harvest Junction um, uh, commercial and residential areas. Uh, the, the site um, is, um, very visible and I believe that that was one of the 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 benefits and attributes of this particular site uh, for Costco. Next, next slide. This is a property site plan and council this um, this exhibit is in your packet um, but I just want to draw your attention that the uh, in the um, northwest um, portion of the of the Site plan is the 17 acres where the Costco warehouse will be located. Uh, to the right of that, there are uh, three or four green uh, pad sites that uh, the owner, Reggie Golden, uh, and the Golden family will retain through the process. And then finally, um, on the lower left side is the nine acres that the, the city will be acquiring for affordable housing. Next slide, please. 
This is a, a site plan that gives a little more detail for the uh, proposed layout of the Costco facilities. And um, just to orient yourself along the north is Ken Pratt Boulevard. Uh, the the north-south roadway uh, is, is coming in. There will be a traffic uh, light that will be a full intersection on, on the highway. Um, it, it will then travel to the south to a, a large roundabout that will be one of the primary entrances into the Costco um, uh, site, as well as the adjacent uh, development pads. The fueling island is on the northern end of the Costco site. Um, and there's also a proposed right in, right out off of Ken Pratt Boulevard in the far um, left upper side of, the, of this um, site plan. You'll notice too that there's another access into the Costco parking lot off of the main north-south roadway. Um, that is the primary uh, truck route where um, all of the supplies that will be coming into and out of the Costco facility will be um, entering and exiting uh, off of Ken Pratt Boulevard and then back out onto Ken Pratt Boulevard. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the, the PPA or P3 agreement, um, the city's contributions of that are the, the actual uh, cost to acquire the 17 acres that will be um, delivered to Costco uh, and the nine acres of affordable housing. Uh, we believe we are uh, acquiring those uh, parcels at very uh, favorable rates. Uh, certainly when you look at uh, development ready property within the city limits, uh, we believe it's, um, it's a very fair price. Uh, the raw water deficits is actually uh, an interesting aspect of the process, uh, project as well. Uh, the first is the 22.66 acre feet of the deficit on the owner remainder property. That is being uh, provided as an economic incentive from the city to the, to the property owner. Now the satisfaction of the raw water on the 26 acres, meaning the 17 acres for Costco and the nine acres for the affordable housing, both of which are going to be acquired by the city. Um, council, if you move forward with the, um, the ordinances to, tonight, uh, they are implementing your raw water uh, master plan. That aspect of the plan where we will utilize a portion of the city's uh, water supply uh, to meet affordable housing needs in our community, as well as to meet um, economic development opportunities that meet the specific criteria called out in the ordinance. The agreement also calls for the funding of the public improvements, as I mentioned earlier, the, the utilities, both the dry and wet utilities, as well as um, all the roadway features and drainage they are being uh, shared, those costs are being shared on a pro rata basis tied to the number of acres owned. And so it, again, it's a 48.66 acre site with the city owning 26 of those acres or being responsible, if you will, for 26 of those acres, which equates to about 53.43% of the uh, project and the owner being responsible for 46.57 again, representing the 22.66 acres that they are retaining. And then lastly, uh, the city also agreed to provide uh, and make available as needed up to um, an additional $3 million to cover some of the private site improvements. Those are the things like the parking lots, the landscaping, um, and the, uh, the lighting. And, uh, you know, one of the callers that called in this evening was concerned about landscaping. Um, I'm, I'm confident that as the project moves through the design review committee process, that we will certainly be uh, sensitive to and looking at having a very uh, robust landscaping plan that um, um, uh, certainly goes to a large extent to screen and provide a buffer to uh, adjoining properties. Next slide, please. Uh, Council, there are also related agreements associated with the with this project. Um, the first on this list is an intergovernmental agreement uh, between the city and Boulder County, which will provide for uh, the approval of Quicksilver Road between North 119th Street and County Line Road as the haul route for the future mining of the Irwin Thomas site. 
And I failed to mention, uh, Council, that part of the project, one of the results that we are uh, achieving uh, through this development of the property is a movement, is a, um, a shifting of the, of the future gravel mining further away from some of the residential properties. And we were certainly getting numerous calls, as I'm sure many of you were as well, um, with residents who were concerned about the pending uh, gravel mining on the property. The use of Quicksilver Road was something that our staff has felt as it, uh, was important for a number of years, uh, certainly uh, preceding uh, the uh, particular uh, project in front of us. Uh, we felt that way for a number of reasons. Um, the first was safety. Uh, we do not believe it is a, a safe route to take um, uh, 100 to 200 trucks a day and, and have them go up 119th Street to the Ken Pratt Boulevard um, expressway, enter that expressway and then exit it at County Line Road only to turn around and go about two miles south. Um, so it's sort of a circuitous route. It, it's also incredibly dangerous when they're on the way back in making left-hand turns at 119th Street across um, four lanes of traffic uh, that are traveling at very high speeds. So we were concerned about safety uh, in, that, in that situation. We were also, um, we, we, we felt that because this route was shorter, that um, uh, we actually calculated a significant reduction in greenhouse gas uh, generation uh, from the burning of the diesel fuel to, to haul the gravel uh, from the mine site to the processing location in Weld County. And we believe that is also an important aspect of it. We also know that it is um, certainly the shortest route uh, to move the gravel. So that intergovernmental agreement, you are not acting on that tonight, but we had it in your packet so that you could see the entire package of information. Associated with that intergovernmental agreement is an agreement between the city and aggregate industries. Aggregate industries will be the operator who will be completing the mining of the Irwin Thomas property, the balance of the property, if you will. Um, that agreement between the city and aggregate industries really parallels uh, what is in the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the county. And in the agreement with aggregate, the city is, is essentially making aggregate the responsible party for the maintenance and care of, the, of Quicksilver Road throughout the mining uh, period as well as the um, mitigation of adjacent property owners, again, during that mining period. Next slide, please. I mentioned earlier, Council, that there are several clawback provisions in the, in the, in the main contract. And just real quickly, a, a clawback provision is, is intended to um, protect the city's investment. And so these clawback provisions are all found in section four of the, of the agreement. Um, uh, what they do is they, they vary depending on where in the process uh, the, the construction of the project was when uh, things didn't go well. And so a clawback is there in the event that um, one or more parties default on the agreement. And what's important to the city, we're investing significant money, as Jim is going to talk with you about in a minute. Uh, we, we did our best in this agreement to uh, protect that investment. It even goes so far as to continue that protection uh, for a certain time period, up to five years, in the event that, um, you know, the public improvements get built, uh, the warehouse is built, it's opened but for some reason it doesn't stay open long enough for the city to derive sufficient sales tax dollars, again, to fully recoup our investment. So that protection is in this agreement as well. Next slide. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to um, Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Jim Golden, um, to talk about the finances of the project. Thanks, Dale. Uh, Mayor, members of council, Mayor Bagley, members of council. I'm glad to pick it up from here. I'm going to get into the financing and the project costs first. I'll start with the total project costs. Um, 
And these are maximum project costs. As Dale mentioned uh, that uh, the city's committed a three, up to $3 million to over and above what uh, Costco is paying for their site development costs. So those, those are maximum estimates and we're hoping that they'll come in at, at less than that. So these numbers uh, could end up being uh, a maximum and much less or, or at least less than what we ultimately pay. The total cost for the projects, and that's the Costco and the affordable housing project, are $23.6 million. The city share of those costs are just below $13 million. The developer costs are $3.6 million, and the Costco costs are $6.9 million. Um, the next slide, please. This is a, a, a matrix that you can find in the council communication tonight. And uh, I've included it here. There is one uh, difference. It is uh, a, a major difference, but I wanted to, just one difference I wanted to point out that I did include uh, since the communication was uh, drafted, the private site development costs from Costco of $6.16 million. So that wasn't on there, but I was concentrating mostly on the um, city's project costs here, but decided to pull that in to show this total project cost and show that they were investing more dollars in there than I, I had shown originally. Um, so uh, next slide, please. And this, this matrix, by the way, I'm gonna slice and dice this up, but it, it does have all the information on any of these cost breakdown that, uh, that I do not uh, break down for you that are in these numbers. So this here uh, are the city's project costs. Costco project is $9.9 .9 million and the affordable housing is a little over 3 million. And these uh, are a little bit higher than what you uh, see in the communication of what I refer to as hard dollar costs of 9.6 million. Uh, both of these are a little bit higher because of the, um, uh, the raw water deficit that Dale talked about. We'll be refunding um, the cash and lieu payments for those purposes and didn't consider those part of the hard dollar cost. Next slide, please. So um, these are the, the city's project funding sources. Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, funding and the affordable housing uh, fund will fund $1.47 million of the affordable housing project. Uh, the rest of uh, the project for the affordable housing and the Costco project will come $11 million, a little over $11 million that we will ultimately be uh, uh, funding through sales tax to be generated by the development. And then there's $459,000 of the rebated fees I was just referring to. Next hey, slide. Jim, yes. Jim, I wanted to make a point really quick. So and it's, I don't think it may be if it's on your next slide. Uh, yeah, never mind. It's on your next slide. Go to that one. <laughs> okay, so the total um, affordable housing project is a little over $3 million. The city's paying, uh, the affordable housing fund is paying for the land cost of $1.47 million. And then the sales tax uh, from the development will pay for the site improvements and the fees related to the nine acre property. So that's uh, $1.455 million. Again, this is, uh, with, uh, this is a maximum cost. Uh, we think that uh, there are pretty um, conservative estimates of cost in here. And then finally, the cash in lieu of water rebate related to this property was 159,000. Does that cover think, what you wanted? Yeah, well, I wanted to say, I think what's important about this is, is the sales tax paying um, half of the cost roughly for the affordable housing project. And it's not all being born on the affordable housing fund. And I think that's one of the positive aspects of this deal is you have this project supporting affordable housing to a much higher level than what we would have normally done in some of our other development opportunities. Okay, next slide, please. So the Costco project costs $9.9 .9 million. Uh, so sales tax will pay the majority of that uh, broken it out though in this, that the first line here is the sales tax paying the land costs and the site improvements uh, fee costs and fees of $6.6 .6 million. And then the $3 million that Dale mentioned that the city is committing for private site development costs, the up to $3 million, as I mentioned before. 
And finally, the cash in lieu of water rebate related to this property was a little over $300,000. Next slide. So um, in order to do this, one of the uh, actions that you are uh, faced tonight, you have a ordinance that will create the Harvest Junction East Special Revenue Fund. Um, that's a uh, fund that we are, are proposing be put together and that we would utilize to put the, um, the, the, the funds from a loan from uh, the fleet fund that we're proposing as well. And you won't act on that until December 1st, but that loan would be for the, the amounts that, um, for the, all of the city's share of the project that will uh, eventually be paid back either from the affordable housing fund and over five years uh, with a $1.17 million loan. Uh, there's about 300,000 that's already budgeted for, for 2021 out of the affordable housing fund. And then $11 million, a little over $11 million uh, for what we just uh, mentioned that would be paid back by sales taxes. Um, so you let the Harvest Junction Special Revenue Fund would, um, would, would uh, take the dollars from the loans. And, and then what would happen is they would we would expend those dollars from that fund. And then as time goes on, we would pay the loans back from this fund. Now, next, next uh, slide, please. So what I'm proposing here as a structure for that loan is that now, as you know, the city has a sales tax rate of 3.53%. And 1.53% of that rate are earmark, earmarked sales taxes. Now those goes towards open space and streets and public safety, and they can only be used for that purpose. So what we're looking to is the 2% that is non-earmarked to utilize that to uh, pay for um, the loans that we're setting up here and uh, ultimately for these, these two projects. So I'm proposing that half of that 2% uh, go into the Harvest Junction Special Revenue Fund that would be used to repay that loan back to the fleet fund. Uh, the other 1% then would go to the general fund and the public improvement fund in the same uh, rate split rate that we use currently for the, uh, the sales tax for the 2%. Next slide, please. So the sales estimates that we have from Costco are that the, for the, based on our sales tax rate and the size of the facility, is that would generate uh, Longmont sales tax of $4.06 million in its first year. So we're estimating that there'll be just short of 26% of that revenue that would come from cannibalization of existing Longmont retailers. Next slide, please. So this here is showing that first year uh, $4.06 million of sales tax. You see up on the upper right side that I have $1,150,000 as the internal loan repayment. That's the 1% uh, sales tax that I mentioned would go to the Harvest Junction Special Revenue Fund. And then the rest of these dollars you're seeing on this screen are the five different funds that we utilize that we allocate our sales tax dollars to. And that's how what the impact would be for them on a gross basis in the first year. Uh, next slide here, please. So now uh, looking at that from a, uh, a net basis after um, deducting the amount of uh, estimated cannibalized taxes that would be drawing from other retailers, it would be just over $3 million of, of net uh, new sales taxes in the first year. And this here is uh, not showing, um, this, this pie chart does not have the 1.15 million on it but that is again in this as well. And it's part of the $3 million. But the other five uh, fund breakdown is shown here. And this shows you what essentially I'm projecting would be the net impact of new sales tax to these budgets in the, the first full year of operation of, of uh, Costco. Next slide, please. So, um, we used 2% uh, growth estimates. And I, I will say that Costco does uh, estimate much greater growth estimates uh, in their first five to 10 years. But as you know, I tend to be conservative and I wanted to uh, try to model this and see what would happen if we were looking at it as from a conservative basis. 
And so what we're showing is that, uh, that Costco would generate a 98.6 million of gross sales tax over uh, 20 years of operation. And then uh, 73 million of new net sales tax over that same period of time uh, after the, the cannibalization factors figured in. The next slide. So this is showing that $98.6 million over 20 years. Uh, you can see the uh, on the right side here, the cannibalized tax is $25.5 million. So essentially we're already receiving that type of tax is what that means. Uh, and then you can see up in the blue on the upper right side, city participation is what we're currently uh, conservatively modeling what we would be paying back the loans based uh, with the sales tax dollars, the loans back to the fleet fund. And then the new earmark tax is $31.6 million. And then uh, the new non earmark tax would be $28.4 million. Next slide, please. So again, I refer to the hard costs of 9.6 million and um, in the recovery of that uh, and this is for um, the Costco project alone, the recovery of that by the gross sales tax within, we would recover that in 2.33 years of opening. So that's all five funds of sales tax. We would receive 9.6 million within two and a third years. Um, and then um, the uh, second uh, part here is the net sales tax. And so looking at it from a cannibalized standpoint, we would recover that same amount in 3.17 years or 38 months of opening. Next slide. So then the city investment of 11.06 million, which is the cost for the Costco project and the affordable housing project that would be funded with sales taxes, those would recover, be recovered by the net sales tax within 43 months of opening. Next slide. Just want to talk a little bit about the, the loans. And uh, we, as council's aware, we have made uh, loans from our fleet fund in the past uh, because we have large fund balances built up for reserves for replacement. Uh, we make these loans at the rate of return of city investments so that the fleet fund uh, doesn't uh, lose anything that it would otherwise be uh, making with its money. Uh, the loan to the affordable housing fund of 1.17 million would be repaid by 2025. Uh, the loan to um, the Harvest uh, Junction fu uh, Fund of 11.06 million, that would be repaid by early in the 11th year of Costco operations. Um, that again is based on very conservative estimates uh, so it could be uh, anything earlier than that as well. Um, next slide. So uh, this is take this is greater uh, loans from the fleet fund than we than we have ever done in the past, and I, I'm not doing this lightly. Uh, we have considered carefully uh, what we're doing with the fund here. Uh, for one, it's the, the bank will be closed after this. I've told Dale that a few times. And uh, what we're, we'll be doing is proposing uh, a new financial policy that uh, interfund loans from the fleet fund should never exceed um, the lower of 70% of the fund balance for replacements or 70% of the average fund balance for replacements over the next five years. And we'll bring that uh, financial policy to you in, the, in our annual uh, financial policy review process. Um, we are, we have a resolution to approve these two loans that you'll be entertaining in two weeks, but the actual loans won't take place until uh, the closing on the property uh, next summer. And at that point in time, based on the loans we have outstanding and how much they will be repaid at that point and what we are, uh, are loaning here, this will be below that 70% figure. And as I said, I recommend that we never get above that part. Now, this, that leaves us more than sufficient funds in our reserve for replacement based on the annual needs that we do have for replacement. We map those out for 15 to 18 years. So we know what we're, we're facing uh, into the future and we continue to do that. So that will, um, this policy will, will should keep us from 
uh, overextending the fleet fund. So that's it for my point. I think Dale, you pick him back up here. Yep. Yes, I am. Thanks, Jim. Uh, next slide. Uh, so council, just real quick. So what are the next steps um, after you uh, consider the ordinances both tonight and then uh, for second reading on, on, on December 1st, as well as the, the various resolutions? Um, so what we're anticipating, as Jim mentioned, that the closing on the property uh, would, would occur at around um, mid-21. Um, and that will be following the DRC review and approval of the land entitlements. Um, uh, in talking with Joni Marsh, um, we, we believe the, uh, we can get through the, the entire planning process in that six to seven month time frame. And, and so that's why we're anticipating mid-21. Uh, at that point, you'll actually have a final plat on the property and you'll actually have property that you can actually um, sell and, and, and convey. Um, at that time, um, all the city and Costco funds will be placed into escrow, and there is a separate escrow agreement that, that is also being executed um, that uh, will, uh, actually it'll be prepared uh, to be executed that will uh, describe and control the disbursements of those funds uh, to pay for the primarily for the property as well as for the public improvements and the, and the uh, private site improvements. Um, at closing or very shortly thereafter, uh, we are anticipating that Costco will then direct the owner uh, to begin the construction of the public uh, improvements as well as the private site improvements. Uh, we anticipate that to be a 12 to month, 18 month time frame. Uh, again, where you'd be building through a winter, and so a lot of that depends on uh, you know the type of winter that we have and the weather we have. Next slide. So in December twenty, um, uh, we'd be looking at the execution of the P three agreements and the related agreements that we discussed. Uh, from that time frame to mid year, complete the entitlement process, and then from July of twenty one. Um, through late 22, again, complete the public improvements and the private site improvements. Next slide. Late 22, uh, we would es uh, uh, estimate that uh, Costco would then begin and initiate the construction of their 150,000 square foot warehouse in Fueling Island. Um, Costco has told us that they, um, they frankly built a number of these stores across the country and that they can uh, typically get those stores built and furnished in about 110 days. So it's quite rapid. And then lastly, um, the agreement calls for uh, sometime prior to July of 24 that Costco would, uh, would uh, move to open the warehouse. And so as you can see, this is a, a several year uh, proposition in front of us um, and um, it's going to take uh, continued diligence to get us through that. Next slide. And with that, Council, um, I think anybody on the team, is, uh, we're all here to, to respond to any questions that you may have. Mayor Pro Tem uh, Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, this is primarily going to be uh, relating to the emails that we've gotten as well as I think one caller, at least tonight. Uh, from the map that we saw, it's my opinion that the Costco specific site does not directly abut the Harvest Junction Village neighborhood. Is that accurate? Right. So uh, I'm seeing uh, nods that's and yes. largely accurate, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, um, as you can tell from the site plan, yes. From, from, from what's been uh, given to us. Uh, so what would more accurately be abutting that subdivision would be the nine acres of affordable housing uh, site for the city. One clarification, Council Member uh, Rodriguez. Um, the, the Costco site is east of the um, multifamily apartment 
um, complex out there. But you're correct that it is generally to the north and east of the single family residential neighborhoods. Okay, what is and, the name of the, the multifamily? Family, excuse me? The name of the multifamily, the apartment complex. I think it's, it's not Harvest, Harvest Junction Village, Village though. I it's don't something think. Harvest Junction, I think. Sure. Um, um, I, I just noted that the the uh, addresses from the emails that watermark. I got. It's watermark. Watermark. Okay. Watermark. Okay. We're generally from the something single right. family development. Generally is who the emails were coming from. That's what I was noting. Um, so as long as, you know, we've, we've pretty much clarified those specifically that uh, it, the Costco specific site will be north of the single family development, but will be adjacent to the multifamily. Correct. Correct. Let me, let me share that again to point yep. that out. Yes. Costco site, you can see the property line here, mm -hmm. adjacent to the multifamily. Um, I think this may be actually a, a detention area, Dale. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, most likely. And, and then with, with the housing, you can see the affordable housing property and then the owner remnant at this location. So the concept that somebody's backyard is looking directly into a huge parking lot is not accurate. Okay. Uh, and then outside of that, both the Costco site as well as the affordable housing site would have to go through the planning and development process if I'm not, you know, and as right. such, therefore has to comply with the city's land development codes, which require buffering and requires, uh, for instance, light mitigation from, from commercial properties upon residential properties and things like that. And that there will also be the appropriate time for people to weigh in when they're going through the planning and development process. Correct. All right. I think that's what a lot of folks are worried about is that uh, A, it was gonna be in their backyard basically, and B, that they wouldn't have the opportunity during the process to voice their concerns. And I just wanted to make sure that those things were reiterated to them if they have not already been by my colleagues on council, that there is a whole process that even the city has to go through when developing properties. Uh, and the city is not immune to these same requirements that any developer would have to go through. I, Thank you. I think we all reiterate what Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez just said. Um, we'll make sure that we, we do that. Um, we'll go with Councilmember Martin and then Councilmember Christensen. Yeah, I just wanna point out that I, I do live over near Harvest Junction and am familiar with the multifamily development there. Um, and uh, those uh, are designed to open into courtyards, as you could see from the map that we had. Uh, so it's not really going to, even though they more closely abut the Costco property, it's not a particular hardship for them because their, you know, their backyard, their recreational and social areas are inward inside the square of the buildings. Councilmember Christensen. Um, I want to thank uh, council members Rodriguez and Martin for their comments. I, I think we're, uh, what I think we all want uh, to convey is that we're not trying to mess up anybody's neighborhood. We really want the best for this town period. And um, I would also like to point that out that uh, there is a greenway on the, uh, to the uh, west of the Harvest Junction uh, area. And also if they walk, I think it's only four blocks north, they'll be over at Dickens Farm neighborhood, which is spectacular. So <laughs> anyway, um, I, I really think this is a wonderful project uh, and it'll be very good for many employees in this town and many people in this town. So thank you to um, Ms. Murillo and to all of you guys for your presentations. Thanks. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, this is for uh, Jim or Dale. Uh, I want to know, you talked about the cannibalization and I was wondering if you've done any analysis on uh, Village at the Peaks generally and Sam's specifically. 
um, Mayor Bagley, members of council, yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> so that is that is how I um, I drew my numbers, and I, I can't go any deeper than that without uh, crossing the confidentiality lines. So. Okay. All right. Then I'm then I'm okay. okay. All right. Good good job on lots of hard work. And uh, appreciate the, the update. We look forward to, to hearing the progress and, and seeing what happens. And of course, all those neighbors who are concerned, um, it has to go through the proper process. Voices will be heard, listened to um, as we proceed forward. But in general, I'm pretty excited about this project and um, we, can be, we can be proud. Uh, Council Member Rodemaker, Dale Rodemaker. Sorry, just one quick note. I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't, um, Thank Jennifer and uh, Reggie Golden, um, two people that uh, I really appreciated working through the details on this particular project. And um, in, in my world, when when somebody gives you your word and, and you stand by it, uh, that's always important to me. And that is what I have found in uh, uh, essentially every conversation and every decision that we've made uh, moving this project through. And so, I do want to uh, acknowledge that and um, express my appre uh, appreciation of that. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. Let's move on. Harold. Yeah, Mayor Council. Um, uh, uh, to the to the point. I also don't want. I want to thank Reggie for taking my call, taking a cold call. Going. Um, are you open to this? Um, I, I really can't say enough about the partnership with Reggie on, on that issue and, and the Golden family and, and taking a leap with us. So thank you, Golden family and Reggie. Um, what I also want to say is thank you to Jennifer, Dale, Eugene, Jim, and the group because it went with something that I was highly involved with to when LHA hit and we were doing that, um, that I had to pivot and we had a team in place and Joni and Sandy and everyone else that said, okay, we're gonna jump in and we're gonna take this so then we could focus on the other issue. I wanted to tell you all that the team that came together to just take it and go was phenomenal. And I wanted to thank them personally in this for covering that when we had to move to something else. All right, so does anyone have anything to add other than thank you, awesome project, staff is awesome, Goldman family's awesome, can't wait, Jennifer Costco, welcome. All right, Dr. Waters. Uh, I move ordinance 2020-62. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Mayor. Yes, Eugene. Uh, I was gonna try to butt in and just remind council that there is a substitute ordinance uh, for council's consideration on the public-private partnership agreement. If we could move that substituted ordinance, that would be great. All right, it, Chair, it, was my understanding, it was my understanding that, that what we are seeing was the substitute ordinance. Uh, but both are in there in the in the packet. The chair is going to take the chair is going to take the motion to mean the uh, the 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 substitute ordinance twenty twenty sixty two. Second still applies. All right. Thank you. So without if there's no further discussion or debate, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right. Ordinance twenty twenty sixty two, the substituted version passes unanimously. Dr. Waters, you're muted. I'll move ordinance 2020-63. I hate it when you cover my screen too soon. I can't second. see it. Second. Yeah, thanks. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor of ordinance 2020-63 say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-63 passes unanimously. Dr. Waters. I'll move ordinance 2020-64. I'll second that one. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. Ordinance 2020-64 passes unanimously. All right. Let's move on to short-term rentals. Harold? <coughs> I take that back. Joni Marsh. Joni. Joni. Mayor Bagley, members of council, Joni Marsh, assistant city manager. So this evening we are back for a discussion about short-term rentals. This is a little bit of a continuation from our July 14th uh, council meeting. Uh, next slide, please. 
Sorry, Susan, I got ahead of you there. So just to a uh, reminder of the current definitions in the code, um, both for council, but also for the public who may be watching this evening. Um, staff did also include a copy of our application form as well as our FAQ and brochure, which is also on our website so that <clears throat> you could be clear on some of the short-term rental requirements. Next slide, please. Um, so again, here are some of the additional rental requirements that are currently at play when someone applies for a short-term rental. Uh, they are uh, with respect to which zoning districts, the number of short-term rentals on any one block in particular zoning districts, compliance with building code, the term of that license, and also some posting requirements. Next slide, please. So I did wanna give council a current snapshot of licensing. So I believe at our July meeting, we talked about our third party consultant host compliance, who really is just that here to help us um, do compliance with folks who are renting on a variety of platforms. Host compliance looks at any and all platforms on the website. So it's not just VRBO or Airbnb, it's up to I think a total 40 or 50 different platforms that advertise. Currently we have, 93 licensed as of writing this council com. Um, the majority of those are residents' primary dwellings along with ADUs. You heard tonight um, on Public Invited to be Heard, it was made mention that there were 12 second uh, or investment dwellings. Um, actually that number we had is seven and as of yesterday that actually went up to eight. So we, we only show eight as a staff. Um, um, each month we get a report from host compliance and I have to say it's actually been very helpful and it's been um, working smoothly to allow us to see what's actually happening month by month. For instance, this month in November we had 69 active listings out on websites. So, so most of those were licensed, some were not, and that allows us to then contact the uh, homeowners or renters. Um, and uh, help them get into compliance and suggest a pathway forward. We also know that everyone's not advertising every month um, their short-term rental. So we see an ebb and flow every month and I think that's helpful for us to know exactly um, who's in compliance and who's not. And it's actually made the workload far more manageable because we aren't seeing a ton of new short-term rentals coming onto the market currently. Um, we also had some commentary on public invited to be heard with regard to one of the short-term rentals. Um, there was, were a bunch of complaint calls, um, I believe, for a property on Arapahoe. And one thing that we discovered um, recently with our host compliance folks is that short-term rental is no longer renting as a short-term rental. And they are, in fact, renting at 30-day or longer time periods. So they would no longer fall under our um, short-term rental definition. So on the 14th, council did give some direction um, that was very specific to removing um, the allowance for Longmont residents to have a short-term rental license on a second or investment property. And staff um, will be moving forward with that unless otherwise directed tonight. We do have a series of questions for you at the end of the presentation, which is only 14 slides, by the way. Um, I know that's going through everyone's head. Um, uh, so uh, next slide, please. So some of the other um, items that we took notes on and I went back and watched the last meeting a couple of times to try to make sure that we um, got a general feel for some of the questions council had, but also some of the common themes. And I think really some of those themes were frankly around compliance and asking applicants really to be accountable for submitting documentation to us. Um, I believe it was Councilmember Martin who spoke about putting some teeth into the ordinance. Um, so um, at the end of the 14th meeting, the other direction we received from council was to bring back staff recommendations. So we do have um, three recommendations for you this evening and a few questions as well. Next slide, please. It's hard to keep up with this 
here and there. <laughs> so in looking at the requirements for verification for someone to apply for a license, we went ahead and looked at um, five other communities, uh, both in the Front Range and Mountain communities to kind of see what they were asking for so we could understand how their compliance um, submittal documents um, were perhaps stronger than what we have in our current code. And we do believe that the adoption of some additional criteria will be helpful. Next slide, please. For instance, one of the uh, communities we looked at is Denver. Denver has recently um, updated their short-term rental ordinance around compliance. So in addition to a, uh, a, a state of Colorado license or ID, they're asking for two or three of these other types of documents to be submitted at time of application. Staff really does believe that this will provide some higher burden of proof from the applicants. So if we did get a complaint, we would actually then have some, um, some documentation to go back on should we need to actually go to compliance or issue a fine or a, a summons to court. Next slide, please. So let's see. So the other um, item we talked about is um, currently when someone applies for a license, you know, they really have to meet what's in the current code in order to be granted that license. If they don't submit the documentation, they don't pass an inspection, then we can fail them. Next slide, please. However, when a license comes up for renewal, one of the things that we spoke with it um, on the 14th was the fact that our revocation criteria were, um, we think, lacking. And I believe council agreed with us that there's some room for improvement. Um, and we looked at some specific language that we found in some other ordinances, and we put a couple of examples on the last page of your council com, which included things like um, when we went to renew, looking at any evidence that we had of non-compliance throughout the time frame that the permit was in effect, or a pattern of nuisance behavior. Um, that we feel that having some of those criteria will then allow us to have a stronger case for revocation. And we also included in your council com kind of a scenario of how that revocation and investigation into um, complaints would work. We have talked briefly to public safety and our dispatch staff about how we might put um, some markers on addresses so that code enforcement and the permitting system, which is tied all to one licensing and the planning and land management system, could then um, tie that same data into CAD so that we would be, so that police officers would know when they go out, there might be a marker on that address that would indicate. And then when we go to pull records to do an investigation, we'd have an easier time of doing, doing just that. And finally, the third recommendation, next slide, please. Um, was really kind of a verification of council's direction. The code currently allows us um, to license someone who owns their home under a different mechanism, be it a trust or an LLC. And that's been the case all along. And we really want to verify that council, um, whether you did or did not want to strike that for a homeowner who had a short-term rental within their current residence. Those are really our recommendations. I have put these into question format. If you'd like to go through each question, I'm also happy to stop here and we can respond to questions. Yeah, so, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the one thing that I do not want to do, I don't know if it, I haven't seen these questions, but I do not want to, a lot of times when staff prepares us questions, we get stuck in a cycle of, there's no way for seven of us to, I, I mean, the form of emotion, so if it's not a staff, uh, if it's not a staff recommendation, I'm going to be really hesitant to really want to discuss anything because we get caught up in these. I mean, we're we're just about ready to be set up for a conversation that's not going to be able to end well. And so I don't know what the questions are, but I've said this before after council meetings. I do not want staff on an agenda putting on questions where we are not in an environment where we can all come together and have, unless there's consensus on every question, it's impossible for staff to get clarity from seven of us, you know? So I'm hesitant to, to go into this, but does anyone have any problems with the recommendations? Only the recommendations at this point. 
Okay, Council Member Peck and then Council Member Martin. And then Council Member Christensen. Um, I was just gonna give my my input on the recommendations. Not okay. necessarily a problem. Go for it. Sure, go for it. So uh, I would say yes on the additional verification. Um, yes on revocation if it includes noise violations or neighborhood nuisances. And just an FYI in your brochure under uh, ADUs, there is a misspelling <laughs> on the word unit. Uh, so that would be good to correct. Um, and then I wasn't sure about, because you, you explained it, um, prohibit prohibition being held by an LLC, but that doesn't apply really from what I understand that you just uh, explained, because that would only apply on the second investment property, which we, did I understand that correctly? Uh, Mayor Begley and Councilman Peck, that, that is our question. We just wanted to verify that you didn't have any issue continuing to allow homeowners who own their home in a different mechanism, be it an LLC or a trust, to continue applying that way. That you really just wanted the trust or LLC with the second investment property to not happen anymore. Okay, then I don't mind if the primary is in uh, a different name. Councilmember Martin? You're, you're, you're silent. I just have a question about the teeth. I liked it very much. I liked the plan. Um, but what wasn't clear to me was if um, at the time that that the, t the tenant gets ticketed for, you know, a noise violation or, you know, too many exceeding the uh, occupancy or whatever, um, that would, you know, be the party house kind of infractions. Um, does the property owner, the lessor, um, also get a notification at that time, or do they not find out that they've been accumulating violations until their license is revoked? Holly? Uh, Mayor Bagley, Council Member Sorry, Martin. Go ahead. Yeah, ask the question. Sorry. I believe that the way that this was laid out is that the <clears throat> currently it would be the person who's creating the violation who would get the ticket. And um, so I think that is something that we have to think through. Obviously code enforcement can tie an address, um, but we could also send an NOV to the property owner letting them know there had been a violation at their property. So we could kind of do a, a couple of different things. That might be something we need to work out a little bit more. I would like to suggest that, that, that the uh, notice of violation sounds exactly right. Okay. Councilor Peck, I'm sorry, Councilor Christensen. I've done that, I just, just keep flipping. Sorry, John. Yes, that's the third time you've called me Councilwoman Peck. Um, you tonight. should be flattered. She's, she's awesome. Yes, well, we are different people. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think this is very good. I think you've gone through a lot of different things here. And um, I do th believe that we should restrict STRs to natural persons. For one thing, a, a limited, an LLC means a limited liability corporation. So then they are not liable for anything. It's, we have to hunt down the actual entity and um, if there's a problem. And because of the way the uh, Secretary of State has stopped uh, any way to find out who is actually involved in an LLC, I think that would make it impossible. And these are actually, you know, supposed to be for just people who live in Logmont to rent out something for 30 days or less. If we open it up to any kind of LLC or trust, it complicates things and makes it considerably more difficult to understand and to prove who's involved and uh, whether they live here or not and whether they have any insurance or not. 
I think we really do need to limit it to um, natural persons. Councilmember Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, Joni, the way this is laid out in the council communication, um, you've got the investment properties as a heading and then with the decision or the vote that was taken uh, back in July. And then uh, what, and then the, the, the recommendation uh, in, in each in a section. Um, so I wanna say, I, I, I would say yes, right, to the recommendations that you bring um, in terms of validating or requiring greater verification of owners or of residents. Um, uh, I, I think we ought to maintain the current uh, status of allowing somebody who's in their home through a trust or an LLC to, to be able to use their home that way. I mean, I, I agree with all your recommendations. However, it looks to me like um, you would bring back an ordinance that would um, include those recommendations to add teeth to the ordinance and uh, prohibit somebody who owns a second investment, a second property as an investment property to be utilized as a short-term rental. We would take that out of the ordinance the way council communication looks. Is that correct? Mayor Begley, Council Member Waters, that is correct. That was the, um, we had a five to two yeah. direction at yeah. that 14th meeting yeah. to proceed yeah. that way. Yep, and I was, regretfully, I was on the, I was among the five because I thought we were voting on something else. Um, and so I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say now, I'll vote against the ordinance when it comes back, even with the teeth that you've added, because I think that's wrong. I think we've heard from residents. Uh, I don't, I think we're trying to solve uh, or, or kill a fly with a sledgehammer. Um, I think there are other ways to solve that problem. And I don't think we ought to deny uh, the opportunity for people who are responsible homeowners in Longmont to have a single other property. They might have a lot, but only one of them they can use as a short-term rental. And I'm gonna, and I'll be, I'll feel badly about having to vote against the ordinance and I'll probably be the only one to do it, but I will vote against it if, that, if it comes back that way. And I, and, and I regret it because I like the rest of what you've done. Uh, Councilor Martin. Okay. Um, yeah, I did vote against the five to two. Um, I had to go back and check, but um, I voted against um, prohibiting people from having more than one short-term rental property. Um, and I still feel that way. And I think that, that we... Uh, uh, have seen with the data that we have about the number of short-term rentals that we have and the number of them that are in the objectionable categories and so on, that this is maybe, um, you know, killing an ant with a sledgehammer uh, and that maybe we don't do it. And I would like to suggest, is it, would it be possible to bring, to sever the, uh, the two provisions and let the council consider uh, whether to place restrictions on how many short-term rentals uh, an individual property owner can have. You went yeah. muted again. I'm sorry. Yeah, I saw that happen. Um, I, I was going to suggest uh, that that maybe the the uh, uh, the language about revocation of licenses. Uh, and uh, notifying uh, property owners when their tenants commit infractions and all of that hoo-ha could be in a separate ordinance because there seems to be complete consensus that that would be a good thing. Um, but we may or may not have a problem about, you know, the original, the original bugaboo of short-term rentals changing the character of Longmont. And I mean, we've got 30,000 plus households in and um, fewer than 80 short-term rentals. So that doesn't seem like it could change the character of a city to me. So I would move that they come back to us as two separate ordinances. All right, the, the, the motion, let's don't, we're not gonna talk about that motion. There was no second, none. So- I'll second um, it. Okay, now it's been seconded. All right, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I was also one of the five that voted originally 
And that was primarily based on the concept that I didn't know what recommendations count, uh, the staff would come back with for regulation. Uh, I don't feel that we went above the call when uh, we originally 18 to 20 months ago said that people could have one additional property outside of the one they lived in uh, be a short-term vacation rental. I feel that the real issue here is enforcement and seeing this list of enforcement um, suggestions from the staff gives me the ability to say, I think some of those are really good uh, recommendations and I'd really like to explore those more uh, before we just hit the ant with a sledgehammer as was stated by my colleagues previously. Um, as far as the LLC trust thing goes, I can understand the argument about LLCs. I also understand folks that have small businesses would prefer to use LLCs. I have an LLC myself. Uh, trusts on the other hand though, are extremely common for owner occupied homes as, as well as many different things. But generally speaking, you do not see trusts being involved with small business um, transactions in, in homes. So I definitely don't see that that problem. I wouldn't, if the requirement for property owners to come up with additional documentation for ownership, much less residency, is, is put into place with suggested re recommendations, I see less necessity for uh, restricting LLCs and trusts because I think they would have, the other would essentially equal out that problem. I, I would rather us move to better enforcement and more documentation and see how that goes before we do drop the, the ban hammer as uh, some on social media call it with the second property. Um, especially realizing that there is a density limit in concept where a second one per block would have to go as conditional use before planning and zoning commission. And I know specifically there, there are a good number of folks that would prefer not to do that. So I, I really would just like to see better enforcement of what I thought was a decent policy when we came up with it 20 months ago before we, we completely do away with it. Thank you. So let's go ahead before we, so Councilor Martin, can you, we've got, can you please restate your motion? Let's have the discussion only about this motion. Yes, I mean, uh, the position that uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez articulated is mine uh, as well. I don't think we need to mess with the rules for what can, can be an Airbnb or not. I think we got those pretty close to right based on the numbers we're seeing. So my suggestion was rather than debate all of that tonight, we just ask um, the assistant city manager to bring back the restrictions on who can do what as one ordinance and the enforcement provisions as a different ordinance. And then we can debate both ordinances separately some other night. So that was my motion, so split the, them in two. So the motion, which was seconded by council member Waters was to instruct staff to bring back two ordinances, one pertaining to what is permitted as far as short-term rentals go. And number two, the second one would apply specifically to enforcement. So the Correct. Gonna, so council member Ridago Faring, what is your comment pertaining to the motion? To this motion, yeah, I was just about, I was gonna say that what council member Rodriguez had said circled us back to what council member Martin had suggested of separating the two. Um, I would support that because I feel these are two different issues. One is around enforcement of what we currently have and the staff's ability to, to uh, for oversight. The other one, I just, I feel like there needs to be more conversation around what that would look like if we, I mean, because we have multi-use zoning, we have different, you know, residential, where could we maybe parse out and have a deeper conversation around where are the troubled areas that maybe we do not need to be having um, several Airbnbs. But, you know, again, I'm looking at the numbers and it's, it's relatively low. It's set seven, eight second um, home investment properties. I, you know, my concern coming in early on 
was around what was it doing to the housing stock for people who just want to buy a home, their first home. Yes. And so that was one of the concerns that I had early on in this discussion. You know, I, I still want to address address that piece on another night, but you know, I want to focus more on the in investment piece or the enforcement piece, sorry. So that's where I'm at. Councilmember Peck, the real one. Thank you. Um, I'm confused by this motion because um, what Councilwoman Hidalgo Faring said that she liked what, Count, what Mayor Pro Tim Rodriguez said, but I don't think that the actual motion addressed what Council, what Mayor Pro Tim was saying. I think what I heard Councilman Waters and Councilman Mayor Pro, Mayor Pro Tim say was that they wanted the ordinance to include owning a second home as a short-term rental. And that, With, that, that, that in point of order, just, just so you know, I mean, not on you, but the motion was made prior to Mayor Pro Tem's comments. Okay, so, but the, so I don't understand the motion. The motion is simply instruct staff to bring back and divide this particular topic into two issues. Issue one is what will we, per, what are the rules and what will we permit around short-term rentals. And then the second topic and second ordinance will be, how will we enforce whatever it is that we decide is permitted? Just in other words, just dividing the topic into two, enforcement and what we will allow. So we will allow A, B, and C. And if you break the rules, we will do A, B, and C or X, Y, and Z. Councilmember Christensen. The whole point of this regulation was to be sure that people in Longmont could afford to live in Longmont. Um, I have attended national uh, conferences, the, the NLC, where people from all over this country are complaining about this issue. It starts off as a little issue and then rapidly turns into a big issue. And then we're dealing with those platforms like Verbo and Airbnb that have millions and billions of dollars. And it can't, we can do nothing once it becomes out of hand. <clears throat> I, I am not opposed to separating this into two different issues because clearly we're not going to agree tonight at oh, 10.30 on anything. <laughs> but I have to say that we decided on this in July, it's five months later, and now people have seemed to have changed their mind. We decided when we voted on this that we wouldn't allow second, hand, second properties, second investment properties. These where people could not even, would, would not even have to live in them. But now we've seemed to be changing our minds about that. And to me, this is, It's very frustrating. We, we agree on something and then months pass and then we decide on something entirely different. To me, this is um, a very strange way to make policy. I do like most of the things that they um, have proposed. Once again, I, I really dislike the idea of people. I know people have trusts. I know how people have LLCs. The reason they have an LLC is so that they are not legally liable. <laughs> Um, and as I said, these are very difficult to find out who's in charge of the LLC and I mean who actually owns it because it's hidden from the state uh, from the state by the state Secretary of State. Um, I think that's a very bad direction to go. It needs to be natural persons so that this is normalized as to just local people. I don't right, think so, we'll so, so, okay. Again, there's a motion on the floor, yeah. right? And so we're talking okay. about, we're, we're only talking about dividing it right now, right? And okay. I, have, I would love to respond, but we need to, we need to just divide it. That's the okay. only issue. So I don't object to dividing it because as I said, we won't decide that here. However, if we decide, divide that and then pass the, all these agreements and we haven't decided whether the major underlying thing, whether we're gonna allow second uh, 
investment properties that people don't live in, then we'll have a whole different set of, we're creating a law that doesn't really cover the things that we might allow or disallow in the secondary thing. So <laughs> I don't see how we can vote on that tonight. We could have it come back. That's a good idea. Right now we're just- I would vote for having them come back as two different things. Okay. Two different ordinances that we're working on. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that we so, can actually have a sensible discussion about it. All right. That is the motion. Anybody else have any, any Dr. Waters, do you have anything that you wanted to add? Okay. Let's go ahead and vote on the motion is to instruct staff to bring it back in two different topics, two different ordinances. One being what are the rules of the uh, short-term rentals and the other being what will the enforcement mechanism be? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. 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 All right. So, staff, that was a perfect example of what I was saying about how I'm going to get frustrated because we are going, that was a pretty simple motion, simple question. And there's 14 of them. I haven't seen the questions, but what do you want to do? Are we going to just go through the questions one at a time? Or would staff like the opportunity to offer a suggestion, at which point we then can discuss each suggestion? Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. We, we did only have three questions that related exactly to the three questions on the recommendation. So um, I think you walked through that. Um, okay. If I could clarify something mm -hmm. um, before we come back with two ordinances. So um, we understand that we can take a look at the enforcement and take a pass on adding that in and some of the changes. We still have a vote on the table that would remove the investment properties I, I think what I'm hearing you say is to leave that in for now, and you will discuss that when we bring forward the two ordinances. Am I am I missing that? So I'm going I'm going to move that we actually permit short-term rentals for residents of Longmont who own a second home, whether it be residential or investment property, to allow them to use that for short-term rentals. Point of order. Yeah, go ahead. I, I don't believe you, you were in the prevailing vote originally. Oh, no, 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 that would, uh, uh, did we ever vote on that particular issue? There was a five yes. to two vote. Yeah, you and yes. I voted against it, Mayor Bagley. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Never mind then. So, Dr. Waters? Well, I was in the prevailing vote. I, I, I wish I wasn't, but I was. And so I'll make your motion. I'll move that we, that we direct staff to bring back an ordinance that allows owners homeowners in Longmont who own a second property that want to use it as a short-term rental to be able to do that and continue doing that in the ordinance that we see returned. So Can I, I <laughs> who seconded that? Marsha. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez? I'm just wondering if, because we haven't actually brought that ordinance, we haven't made a change. Right. I'm just curious. I'm sorry. It's just a procedure thing. Do we actually need that motion? Well, I mean, no. just to provide clarity. I, the only reason, I, all I was trying to do is provide clarity to what I'm hearing. I, I was just trying to move us along. That's it. I understand. So, I'm just saying, so, do, is the, yeah, is the so, motion even necessary? I'm just, I can even make the point that, sorry, Dr. Dr. Waters, your motion is out of order. It's not the regular council meeting after we made the motion. And I mean, we could... This, I mean, I could do that all day long when I wanted to procedurally just be a jerk. No, I'm not but trying to do that. I'm trying to be yeah, accurate. Yeah. No, no, I, I know. But what, I'm just, I'm just. So the the reality is, I mean, we we've heard tonight from I thought more than four people that said, "Let's go ahead and do this." That's all I was doing. Um, and so uh, uh, the real question. So the question, the motion on the table is to uh, instruct city staff to bring when they bring back the ordinance to permit. Residents of city residents of Longmont to use a second home for short-term rentals. Um, Dr. Waters, I just for the purposes of clarification. Uh, so we do have a motion on the. On we the, have a motion on the table. It's been seconded by Councilmember Martin. But then I'll just I'll just be quiet and we'll let this go. Councilmember Christensen. It seems to me the simple thing to do is just bring it back. We already have, it is already legal right now to have a second home. So there, there's no need to have, as 
Councilman Rodriguez says, there's no need to do this, it's already legal. The whole th point of bringing this back in the first place was to take that out. So, so we can do that at, an, at another time. I'm going to... I'm going to vote for it because I think I've heard from the majority of the eight people who have short-term rentals like this. I'm going to read you a, read you what I got. I said, I hope you are well, sir. Just wanted to let you know we gave up on our city council because they scared us um, in the middle of the lockdown revisiting short-term rentals. So I am now selling my short-term rental and home and I'm heartbroken about it. I will land okay, but I'm sure I'm, I'm, I will land okay. I'm sure, but still heartbroken because I had a good business going. I hope you don't back down. And then they go on did say some unsavory things, but, um, but she says, but quite frankly, I don't care anymore. I'm just so upset. Um, so th we need to, we need to provide, I mean, there are people out there. I mean, I know ironically we're talking about, you know, providing stability of housing and providing affordable housing, but what we're doing is interfering in the property rights of people who have, we are, yes, we are, <laughs> we are, we're telling property owners what to do with their property. And there's eight people, um, I think that's eight. Yeah, eight people um, in Longmont who those are the only people were impacting by saying, and then we've also heard, and this all came about because there was one nuisance property that we're hearing other things that they kind of put fuel on the fire. And so right now there's a motion on the table to permit this. And so let's go ahead and vote and then we can discuss it when it comes back. Councilmember Peck? I, I would like a clarification before I. Uh, ask for an amendment from uh, Joni Marsh. It was mentioned that LLCs, and I also tried to find out who the owners of LLCs were, but uh, the only one that signs it is the agent. How would you know if someone uh, buying a property under an LLC to use as a short-term rental is actually a resident of Longmont? How would you know that? So we would, you can go to Dora's website and you can look up the registered agent for those LLCs. Um, and then we would also um, could, as we propose tonight, be asking for additional uh, ownership verification information that would be able to tie that back. So we feel confident we have the ability to um, ask for the right verification. And again, um, the Dora website is available. Um, How do you spell that? Every day. Dora, D O R A. D O R A, okay. And, All right. And Thank I just want to I just want to chime in, but a limited liability company is not to prevent liability in a criminal sense. It's just no. to protect you from debt. If you take a, if you take out a loan from a bank, it's just for, to isolate the individual investors from the property itself mm -hmm. or the business itself. You can still mm -hmm. ask who the owner, you might not be able to go to the Secretary of State can get that information as Joni said when they sign up and if you're going to hit an individual or you're going to hit an LLC with a penalty it's all going to be financial if somebody's on the property as an attorney and they're sitting there making noise you can't hold the I mean you could say you know the city could say you've got a nuisance property after a while and take it to court but you're not going to be able to hold an owner LLC or otherwise criminally liable for any crimes that someone conducts on the premise. I mean, it'd be kind of like if Joan kills me in a hotel. The hotel's not criminally liable. Joanne's like, oh, that'd be awesome. Or Joe, Joe's like, that's awesome. No, but I mean, my point, my point is that you don't escape criminal liability. You don't escape the problems I think that we're concerned about because it's an LLC. But those are all questions for another day. So let's go ahead and vote. And the, uh, the issue is, the motion on the table is uh, to direct staff to bring back in the ordinance um, making it permiss making it permissible for Longmont residents who have a second home in Longmont to use such home as a short term rental. All in favor? Did I get that right, Dr. Waters? You did. Okay. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. Nay. Okay. I didn't hear a lot of eyes, but I heard one nay or two nays. Yes. Okay. Two nays. Um, Su Susie, are you a nay or an an, an aye? She's an I. And then Dr. Waters, you were an I. Mayor Pro Tem, were you an I? An I. Marsha, were you an I? Okay, I was I. an I. So the motion carries five to two um, with Council Members Christensen and Council Member Peck opposed. All right, Joni, what other questions do you have for us for clarity? 
There was a third. Did we get them all? You did get them all. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. And we will be back and we will try to do that oh. promptly. All right, great. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, I would strongly suggest that you, Joni, you're gone. <laughs> She's like, I'm so out of here. It's 10 I know, at night. Trying to get out of here. Uh, that you be, that you are, uh, that two of, at least two of the um, mandatory proofs be voter registration and federal and state tax returns. Okay. That, 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 and the chair would remind everybody that without a motion, it's just a suggestion. Yeah. But, yep. Okay, that's okay. All right, so let's go on to, all right, so the next question is, before we started tonight, Harold told me that we could take 12C and 12D and put it on a future agenda. Are we at 1240 or 1040 at night prepared to launch into an update on the 2019 Greenhouse Gas Inventory and Climate Action Task Force recommendations, along with the solar feasibility study? Or do we want to, I'm, I'm seeing no, um, uh, but I'm gonna leave it up to you guys. So do, do we want a motion to carry these two items? Do it. <laughs> Council Member Martin, who I probably... will postpone C and D to a future meeting. Second. Second. <laughs> you know what? That was so powerful. Can we just have the motion be Council Member Christensen? Because that was that would, no. Council Member Martin made the motion, Council Member Christensen seconded the motion. Um, if there's no further debate, we're going to vote on postponing or tabling. Uh, the solar feasibility study and the update on the 2019 greenhouse gas inventory and climate action task force recommendations. I see it, Susie, until uh, until a future meeting, uh, which we'll 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 get together with Harold and we'll put that on quickly. It won't be. It's not going to be weeks and weeks. It's just it's 10:40. Council member, that's, that's what I was going to ask to yeah, see no, if, is, it, 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 it's if it's not. It's not. It's not in, it's not indefinite. It's, on the, it's going to be on the soonest agenda that Harold can get it on. Right, okay. Harold? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. So the ayes have it unanimously. Okay. Let's move on to final call. Public invited to be heard. Let's take a quick two to three minute break and come back and, and hear from the public. All right, do we have anybody in there? Mayor, we did. It appeared I let them in and then they disappeared. So they may have had second thoughts. Okay. So well, we have no one at this okay. point. Okay, all right. We're gonna go ahead and move on then. 
Uh, let's go to mayor and council comments. Who would like to make some comments? Council member Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I'm gonna give a, a really fast update on some of the things that are happening on RTD, if you don't mind. Um, first of all, I wanna thank everybody who called in or emailed, especially mayors and commissioners coalition and the Metro mayors on retaining that FISA account, the Fast Tracks internal savings account, because not only did the board vote to retain it for two years, they put $17 million more into that fund, bringing it from 120 million to 137.3 million. So that tells me if they can do that, perhaps maybe their financial picture isn't as dire as they would like it to be. Um, and also that the CFO is no longer with RTD. She accepted a job in California, which uh, is good and bad. Um, our, new, uh, our new director who's gonna replace Judy Lubrow Lubau is Eric Davidson. I'm going to have a uh, conversation with him on Thursday. I'm real excited about this guy because he's been following RTD finances for years and he's very much up to date with what's going on and has some good ideas. Um, we are, according to Phil Greenwald, going to have the uh, Front Range Rail Coalition come to our December meeting and give an update and Harold's shaking his head, so I think I got that point right. Um, I'm excited about that for two reasons. Uh, Front Range Rail needs a conduit to Union Station. Um, they're looking at two things, the Metro North um, rail line through RTD and the Northwest Corridor. The Northwest Corridor is a better fit for them because the North Metro line parallels uh, I-25. It doesn't necessarily get as many communities along the way that the Northwest Corridor does. So um, they're looking heavily at Northwest Corridor. That's good for two reasons. Number one is that they have, uh, they have a grant, a federal grant that they are going for. They, they have an in into federal tax dollars through transportation. Um, so if they, choose the Northwest Corridor as part of their plan, then perhaps we can get some dollars that way through, uh, through the Front Range Rail and through Amtrak, which is the line that they are going to use instead of the regular freight, uh, not freight, but the regular transportation. Uh, we wouldn't really have to buy rail cars is what I'm saying. If Amtrak does it, they have their own rail cars and they already have a really good relationship with BNSF. So uh, and the other good thing about it, they really like our peak service because Amtrak is not making money on their long runs anymore, especially through the pandemic. They are going to commuter as well and peak service. So it fits right in with our plan. Um, what else was I gonna say to you really fast here? Uh, and may it get done before 2050. Yes. I am pushing really, really hard on this. And um, I want to thank our mayor, uh, Bagley, for being a very, very loud voice at uh, the Mayors and Commissioners Coalition. Uh, I've been there when he's let him have it, and it's been really nice. And I also want to tell you that even though it's been in the background, we have spent three and a half years selling this peak service plan. And it was a hard sell at first with a lot of foot stamping and tantrums. And But we had to get all of the lobbying groups, all of the mayors and uh, elected officials, all the commissioners, everybody on board. And it took three and a half years. It's a lot of, uh, just a lot of work. So um, I, I want to thank everybody for your help and to me <coughs> that it's going to take all of us to push it. And if I can keep you involved, and uh, I'm going to need your help. And as I think Harold will attribute to that. We also have a way to, um, DJ Mitchell is our BNSF guy that RTD has been talking to, communicating with. And for years, Henry Stoppelkamp has told us when I say us, I am talking about the people who are, who are pushing for the peak service, uh, Judy Lubau and myself, Phil Greenwald, Harold, 
um, and, and uh, Mayor Bagley that we could not talk to DJ Mitchell, that he only wanted to talk to Henry Stoppelkamp, who's with RTD. Well, that wasn't really true. So I do have uh, DJ Mitchell's phone number now, and hopefully we'll be setting up a conversation with him, with Mayor Bagley, with Harold, because what we really need, the, the one thing we're missing here is an engineering analysis from BNSF. They have it, they need to be paid for it. RTD is uh, not willing to pay for it and not really willing to have that conversation. So because we now have $137.3 million in that FISA account, I think that FISA account can be used to pay for this engineering study so that we can get peak service into the Dr. Cog tip process. But in order to do that, you have to have some shovel ready projects. We can use this $137.3 million to build platforms, to pay for the engineering study, to make it a shovel ready project to get funding from Dr. Cog and the federal government. So that's what I need help with, is to just be yelling at RTD that we need to use that $137 million before some other project wants it, wants that money. There's a lot of tentacles reaching like an octopus for that money. I think we need that money and uh, we need to yell and scream about it and be more than assertive. So that's where I am, that's where I'm going. Uh, this is uh, the third bullet point on our work plan, transportation. It is the biggest economic driver rail is, and we have a partner now hopefully with Front Range uh, Rail and Randy Grauberger. So that's it. I'm excited about this. Finally, finally, I think we can move. The time is right. The money's there. We have a new uh, director. We're going to have a new CFO. And that, that's it. So thank Thanks, you. For Thanks, Councilmember Peck. Uh, may, I, may I interrupt one minute? I can't it's, see a face who's talking. It's Susan. Okay. Um, right before I went to go lock the meeting, Two callers made let's their way ahead. in. Let's let's go back to final call public invited to be heard. Thank and you. Invite them in. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to unmute the first caller. This is the one that dropped off previously. Caller five two five. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Your phone number ends in five two five. Are you there? I'm here. You may be. I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Brian Johnson of 926 Kaufman. It's good to see everyone. I miss the in-person meetings. And um, if Strider, if you're out there listening, I want to tell you hi. You're my boy, Strider. And I miss you. Um, but I'm calling specifically because I had a couple questions about this presentation on the Costco thing. I thought Jim Golden did a great job and presenting the numbers, especially when he used the maximum figures. Uh, this is what, at the most, is going to cost us. His predecessors that spoke, um, unfortunately, I, they kind of really did all benefits. Uh, um, you know, like mentioning things like it'll create 260 jobs in five years. That's an odd quantification. We need to know how many jobs in the first year? How many in the second? How many in the third? How many in the fourth? We were talking about spending thirteen million dollars here. Also, we need to know. We, it needs to be, you know, clear that not all two hundred sixty of those jobs are going to be Longmont residents. You know, if it's only a hundred, if it only employs one hundred or one hundred and fifty Longmont residents, that needs to be included in that analysis. And um, you know, it just kind of seemed too sales pitchy to me to include all benefits and not address things like the one to 200 trucks that they said that it will now be on 119 and the traffic congestion that, that will result from that. And I just ask that, you know, you're not, uh, I sent you guys an email, you might see while this was going on that said this, but you're a public administrator, not the sham wow guy. 
So we need the full picture on jobs. We need the full picture on the negative aspects, not just the benefits of Costco. Um, and I thought Jim Golden did a good job of that, but I think there's still a lot of questions out there as to specifics on other details of the plan, and I wish that we could get a more objective presentation on those. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Brian. All right, next caller. And Mayor, that uh, second caller hung up, so okay. we, right. we are well, done. We're going to continue with uh, Mayor and Council comments then. Council Mayor Martin? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I guess you can say anything you want to in public, invited to be heard. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to talk about um, free speech because, uh, you know, when I write things in the newspaper, I am representing myself. It says that in italics, you know, right under my columns that my opinions are my own and don't necessarily represent the opinions of the city council or the city of Longmont. Um, and so I think it's a little bit disingenuous for people to call up and, uh, and, and uh, essentially initiate a debate about a per the personal statements of a member of the council at the city council. Um, that said, um, you know, it would be slander if you could slander an elected official to say that I am against fracking. What I am against is what the people of Longmont are against, which is paying for stuff that people in other cities get the benefit of in their taxes. You know, I think it's pretty impressive that, um, that uh, Councilwoman Peck uh, talked about RTD because one of the things that I hear about a lot is, you know, how long have we been paying um, taxes on RTD and we're never going to get our train? Well, I, you know, I'm really excited too that because of the diligence of Councilwoman Peck and others that we may finally get our train, but it's been a long time that we haven't had one and we've been paying for it. And similarly, um, you know, I don't, I'm not for fracking, but what I am for is protecting the people of Longmont from it. And the agreement that Longmont has um, with Cub Creek Energy and, um, and the assignees of, of the mineral rights, whoever they may be in the future, uh, is protecting Longmont from having drilling inside the city limits. And um, if Joe Salazar succeeds in forcing us to go to battle um, with those people because they're drilling underneath the city of Longmont um, and we lose that battle, then it could, uh, it could have us back to a, a situation where we have uh, a well pad five miles from the swim beach at Union Reservoir inside the Sydney limits. Uh, and that might just be the beginning. So what Joe Salazar is really trying to do is set a precedent so that other cities can have fracking bans, even though Longmont doesn't need any anymore because Longmont is already protected from fracking inside the city. Um, so I don't like it when people lie about what I say. And I'd also just like to end this little rant by saying uh, that the sponsor of Senate Bill 181, which is the law that not very good lawyer Joe Salazar is trying to use to get fracking bans for other cities. Um, Point of order. I know. Pardon. What what is your what is your point of order? Um, if we're talking about slander, I think you just just did slander Joe Salazar. All right, but those, uh, those so points of order can't be used just to interrupt somebody. You have to have a real point of order. So it's overruled. Okay. All right, keep going. I, mean, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's not slander to say uh, I don't think somebody is a very good lawyer. Um, <coughs> But I would like to quote Steve Fenberg, who is the hero of, of the Colorado version of the Green New Deal, um, about what he said about uh, Senate Bill 181. 
He said, Senate Bill 181 doesn't actually mention bans. It doesn't give municipalities that authority because the existing case law would still stand. So I don't know what Mr. Salazar is doing, but I do know that I don't want Longmont to have to pay for it so that somebody else gets a fracking ban. And that's why I wrote that column and it has nothing to do with city council business. That's it, thanks. All right, Dr. Uh, uh, we're gonna go with Mayor Pro Tem, then you, Dr. Waters. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Just as a consideration of my colleagues, as well as the city staff, I would like to let you know that I did participate in a panel for the Community Foundation of Boulder County uh, Leadership Fellows Group this afternoon with State Senator Stephen Fenberg, uh, State Senator-elect Jaquez, uh, Jaquez Lewis, uh, County Commissioner Matt Jones, as well as Boulder City Council member Junie Joseph. And I did my best at all times to only relate council positions that were voted on and then making sure that all other positions were clearly my own as well as avoiding disparaging any staff members or council members, even when baited directly. Uh, Cause that did happen and it was uh, trying to avoid a bunch of landmines, I'll tell you what. Um, but I just wanna let my fellow co colleagues know that I did participate in that event this afternoon, as well as the staff members and that there were Longmont specific topics that did come up in that. Uh, outside of that, uh, I would say that I was very encouraged by the other elected officials and what I felt to be synergy among the city, county, and state level elected officials as far as to um, some really good things that are going on at the state, county, and local levels for Boulder County at large. So thank you. All right. Doctor, uh, anyone else? Dr. Waters, you wanted to say something? Okay. Well, I'd say good on Mayor Pro Tem for not disparaging other council members or or representing council positions. <laughs> I didn't check with folks. Uh, I, I just, I just want to. I'm going to go back to uh, a couple of the of the themes that Councilmember Martin um, brought out in her comments. Since since we were both um, uh, featured in the public invited to be heard comments tonight, and um, well, it, I just would, just a couple of thoughts. One is that I think the public invited to be heard portion of the, of the agenda is one of the most important parts of the meeting. I, I mean, I, uh, it, it was way more fun when we were in, in person and it's limited, you know, in this format. Uh, but I do think it's one of the great aspects of local government. It's the form of government closest to the people. And it's like every Tuesday night, it's a town hall. I, I just think it's a, it's a, it, it, is, it differentiates or distinguishes local government from other forms of government. So the last thing I'd want to do is squelch that. It is, it is people exercising their first amendment rights in the, you know, the purest form of democracy, it seems to me. So when I get the chance to do that as a, as a resident by writing a letter to the editor and, and, in, and people using their first amendment rights to criticize me for using mine and labeling it as whining. I just think, they think that's an interesting, interesting commentary on how the process gets used. Just for the record, nobody's listening to this except the people in this screen, I suspect, and nobody's going to care. But just to set the record straight, uh, I did write a letter to the editor. I didn't think anybody would read it. And I'm not certain the people who commented on it actually read it because it was really the, the, what I said was a total distortion from what I heard tonight. For the record, I'm opposed to fracking inside our city limits and within 2,500 feet of our city limits. I voted for the 2012 fracking ban. I would vote for it again if it was on the ballot. Uh, I support the mission of Colorado Rising. Uh, I was proud when we signed a contract with Cub Creek and top operating to, to close down uh, uh, wells, to move up uh, surface operations outside the city limits, because I think we did what our, we fulfilled our first obligation to Longmont residents, and that is to act on behalf of, on behalf of their health and safety, which is, which is what, we, what we were able to accomplish through that contract. 
Um, I thought I think we made a good decision as a council to remain neutral in this lawsuit when it was filed. Um, uh, but but it wasn't without expense. We remained neutral, but again, we used resources in a time of some austerity to defend ourselves in a lawsuit uh, where we'd already been through this process. Uh, no one, could, no one. We didn't ever hear anybody. But would you like to be a defendant in a lawsuit and defend yourself again? Basically, to put it potentially at risk our citizens by putting us in a position to breach a contract that we signed. But my real opposition that I tried to express as a resident, not as a council member, and I was explicit as well, that I wasn't representing anybody's views but my own as a resident of Longmont, my objection was to a fundraising campaign to, to cover the cost for an appeal that would keep us as defendants in a lawsuit and have further deplete Longmont city resources um, to accomplish what we've already accomplished in a time of austerity. That, that was the concern. So if, if anybody's listening, um, the, the, the callers were right. I ran as a candidate in opposition to fracking in Longmont. That hasn't changed. Uh, I think I would continue to do whatever we needed to do to, to, to protect the health and safety of our residents. Um, but I'm not going to give up my First Amendment rights to write a letter to the editor whether people like what I write or not. So I'd love to be engaged with, with residents where we have a chance to, in, to go back and forth. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting to, you know, to have the comments where we can't respond when we're called out individually. Um, and maybe there are other places we'll be able to do that. So thanks for the opportunity, Mayor Bagley. Well, you're welcome, Dr. Waters. Anybody else? All right, I don't have anything to add. Oh. Uh, Councilmember Dago Faring. Yeah. Um, so I just I wanted to um, to add. So last Friday I was in on that Zoom meeting. I don't know. I think we all got. I, I don't know. I'm on the emailing list for the Colorado Municipal League, and it was the special meeting for municipal officials with Governor Polis's response advisor, and um, it was really just it was concerning to see the numbers to see how. It, we are progressively getting worse with this virus. Uh, I do get frustrated to hear, you know, national level pushing it on states, states pushing it on counties, counties and, you know, being an employee of the school district, putting it on the district. And then everybody's kind of pushing it to other, other entities. But really it comes down to each one of us and our behaviors, our actions, washing your hands, taking this virus seriously, wearing your mask, um, you know, in the matter of a week, we went from having in my in my own building, 35 kids in quarantine to 164. We went from one teacher in quarantine to 13. And this is happening in all the schools nationwide. This is not sustainable. Um, in meeting with the criteria for what constitutes quarantine, what we do in businesses will look very different in schools and in the classroom, but yet we're following those same guidelines. And, you know, I keep asking questions about the sustainability. Let's look pinpoint specific for, for daycares, for schools, for different businesses that would warrant a different kind of structure for quarantine that can, that can keep people safe, but still sustainable. And, I think, you know, I, I, I get frustrated because I do feel like we're, we're kind of making it up as we go along. But again, it's going to come down to each one of us and our behaviors, wearing your mask, social distancing, limit those, those gatherings. I'm all for a good rally and oh, and wash your hands too, please. Um, I'm all for a good rally and advocating First Amendment rights, but space out, wear your mask you know, be cognizant because our actions have impacts for other people. And, you know, it could be just because I haven't slept in several days so trying to manage my classroom and planning. But, um, you know, this is something that it's, it's hurting our kids, you know, and we, we need everybody to, to step up. You know, you think about World War II and, you know, do your part for Uncle Sam, you know, 
we're in that same position right now. Wear your mask, space, you know, do a little sacrifice on that end so we're not collapsing our economy, so we're not hurting our students, our children, and our mental health. So that's all I have to say. All right, thanks. And all right, all right. And let it let the record reflect that uh, Mayor Potem Rodriguez gave dance hands or jazz hands. So thank you, Mayor Potem. All right, Harold. No comments, Mayor Council. Eugene, you asleep? No, Mayor. Edge of my seat. No comments for you. All right. Can we have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded by Councilmember Peck that we adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, I'm going to assume that Councilmember Christensen wants to go home. So the motion carries unanimously, and we'll see everybody later. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>